you can start because Good morning, colleagues. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm standing in for Prof. Maria from ARP, who can unfortunately not be here this morning. I'm um, Vikas van Sale from UJ Press. Willem, can you hear us? <laughs> so we've got a wonderful program lined up for today. Oh, my God. Um, Willem? <laughs> uh, so first up is Dr. Eileen, Irene Libber. She will be speaking on epic quests of learning, harnessing visual novels for education. And then Prof. Maria Glukova is going to speak on theory meets mystery. After that will be Dr. Michael Adarqua, who will be speaking on the effect of educational mo mobile games on learning performance. Thereafter, Dr. Heyman Hadman Mayberg will be giving two presentations, one on artificially intelligent non-player characters, and secondly on Jexed the journal that will be published in collaboration with UJ Press. Um, the speakers, um, you know the program, please, when it's your turn to present, unmute yourself, start your camera and share the screen. Our team from the marketing and events team here at the library will be able to assist you with any technical issues. Um, thank you, Dr. Liver. We are excited to hear your presentation. Thank you very much and hello everyone. So let me do the famous words of let me share my screen. Always the fun part. And I hope you can see the full screen. Uh, let me just open this on my side here as well. Always fun if you've got two screens and they do not communicate with one another. Okay. All right. I am taking it, you can see my screen and there is not a problem. So give a shout if you can't hear me, give a shout if um, we can I go too you. fast. Oh, perfect, thank you, you so much. You. Ah, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. Now, um, thank you for this opportunity to share this with you. And I think I've got the nicest slot because my pre presentation is not heavy academically inclined. So I'm going to ease you into this um, symposium of today and just share some general tips and things with you. There will be a little bit of research, but overall, I'm going to talk about, for me, fun things. So um, Trevor, my co-presenter, cannot be here today. He was really instrumental in this entire project and in the research. So a big thanks to Terence in his um, absence for helping me and joining and collaborating with, um, in this project. Now, today I'm going to touch on a few things. Um, and what I really want to spend some time on is the last bullet point there on the 13 tips. And obviously, since 13 is my lucky number, it will be 13 tips. I've squished into it to be 13, not 16, 13. So I'll just spend some time on the 13 tips. And those 13 tips are really not um, rocket science. It is general things, but it is definitely concepts and aspects that we need to focus on a little bit when we design games, or in this case, then a visual novel. So I really like using games, I, yeah, games and visual novels, because I believe that students, although they have the textbooks and they have access to the content, unless they really walk in the shoes of the person whose story they are living, they do not necessarily take ownership of this. Um, there's a hand raise. Bonnie. Yes. You are welcome to ask a question. Vonnie? Okay. I'm not sure if Vonnie has a mic, otherwise just type in the question if the moderator will just give me a hint if there's something in the Q&A or in the chats that I am missing. Okay, so I'm sure by now most of you are familiar with what is a visual novel, but just maybe to quickly touch again on some of the concepts there is because it is a novel, it is obviously a narrative. So there's a story to be told. So we are journeying on a story here. And because it's game-based learning in the novel, there's a lot of interaction, the, there's players. So the participant or the person who engaged in the story or in this novel needs to do some activity. It's not like the old, old days when we had e-learnings and it was just click next, the next, the next, and 
there was no real interaction. So for us, there's really the player immersed in this, even in my case, if it's a low tech game, he still needs to, he or she needs to immerse in it and they need to make decisions and um, reap the consequences of their decisions as well. Now, from a lecturer's point of view, I really like it because it is easy to adapt. Um, if there's a change in the content or in some of the um, guidelines or protocols, I can easily adapt it. And it is relatively easy to develop depending on which platform you use. I have no programming background. As a matter of fact, those who know me will know I really struggle with programming. So I need something that is easy to adapt, easy to develop, and easy to, work, to create without having to ask other people to help me. Then from the student's point of view, our um, interactive or our virtual um, game-based learning novels are quite intuitive. They know where to click. There are links and they can read and click and do their activities. And from their side, it is really low-tech requirements. So they do not have to have the uh, uh, software and the programs. We as the lecturers need to have it, but they do not have to have it. We usually upload it for them on the LMS and they can access it there. Now, there are a few examples of visual novels, and I just grabbed the, the three at the side from the internet, but the one in the middle, I just quickly want to spend a few seconds on, and this is one that we developed at the Central European University. This was two PhD students, and what is interesting here is that they took a chapter, each one of them, a chapter of their PhD um, thesis, and they created or converted it into an interactive novel. Now, very often we find that um, theses are not that frequently read, and in doing this, they make it, open it up to a wide, wider um, public. So this is an open educational resource that they've created, and it's for undergraduate students, but also for high school students or any one of the public who wants to know more about this. And this is how the visual novels look. The one on the left side um, is on, about the Ottoman history, and, and Flora created this one in Sugar Coop. Uh, oh, Sugar Coop, nah? yeah, yeah, Twine Sugar Coop. And after lunch, we're going to touch on Twine again. And you'll see hers look a little bit different from the other one. She's got this um, bar, navigation bar at the side, where the one about the Crusaders on the right-hand side doesn't have the bar because that one was created in Twine in Harlow. So these different um, story types that you of story formats that you can use. Um, but what is nice here, again, is they created the narrative. In Flora's um, situation, or in her case, you play the role of um, someone in this in this narrative, and you go and talk to different people, whether you go talk to your mother or to the priest. And every time they go somewhere, it branches again in different in directions. The one um, that Juan Manuel created, the one on the Crusaders, you can choose who you want to play. There are two people that you can play, and depending on who you play, you have a different perspective and a different view on what the Crusaders did and how they functioned and the entire history about that. And again, depending on which side you choose, that, that also branches out and you have different pathways in that. So this is just two examples of visual novels that um, students has created, uh, which is really, really quite impressive um, to see. Now, stepping back, if, taking a few steps back, um, I want to start and say, okay, so where did I start with this no interactive novels and game-based learning. And this started really, really, really long ago. Um, it was BC. So before COVID, um, we had a, 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 a concern. I, at that stage, worked in at the University of Pretoria, and there was a concern about academic dishonesty. And we needed to address this as a matter of urgency. So what we did is, first of all, we addressed it from faculty side, and I'm not going to spend time on that, but we did an escape room with also in the, in the line of a visual novel with branching scenarios and a narrative, which they had to, to do. But that one we did actually in person, and as I said, we focused on policies and procedures there, so I'm not going to talk about that one. The one that I actually want to share with you and want to talk about is the one that we did for the students, and this is really plain 2D, not high, um, high AI characters and everything. This is just a flat surface. 
So this game we created and the student then is the person in the game. And you will see in this game, we do not have an avatar for the student. So the student can be male, female, from any race, any ethnicity, um, any orientation, whoever they are, they play as that person. But what we did um, create in this game is we created for them a companion. So they can choose who they want as their companion. And there are two companions. And the one is kind of very weird. And the other one is a little bit more sophisticated and give a little bit more proper inputs into um, the discussion when the students make certain choices. But again, it branches. And depending on the branches, then there are some activities and quests that the students have, have to solve. But then the entire... Um, game is built on a narrative on and uh, uh, it follows this, uh, the the um the format of of a novel see for me it is now um, eight o'clock at night so i've used up all my english already now so now i struggle with english <laughs> uh, so there is our novel that we've created or our game and um I've also used this as part of my game-based learning um, elective that I facilitate as an example for the students. Now, if I can link a little bit now to the research we've done, and as I've said at the beginning, I'm honestly not going to spend a lot of time on the research, but we did this research at a business school in Santon, South Africa, and it was an undergraduate course. And the students there received an orientation session when they joined the business school, on orientation, they have a lecture on anti-plagiarism and academic honesty. And then there is an academic writing course that is a, an optional course that they can um, register for. And we've used the game in this course to um, see whether this game has an impact on people's knowledge of plagiarism or anti-plagiarism or academic dishonesty. Now, the study was in two phases, and the first phase was really a pre and a post test. So there was 12 questions, and it was identical questions. The questionnaire was voluntary, so the, when the students opened the game, they got a, a prompt that asked them, do they want to participate in the, in the study? And if they said no, they can still continue with the game. So that was fine. So then none of the information was collected, but um, they could still have access to the game because we didn't want to force them to participate or manipulate them in, in participating in the research study. We really wanted them actually to do the to read the novel or play the game so that they can update their skills on, um, on plagiarism. So if you look at the results there, you can see that the post-test results are substantially higher than the pre-test results. Now take into account that these students already had an orientation session orientation session on plagiarism. So it's still then interesting to see that there's this change between the pre and the post test. And we didn't have a huge group. We had 66 students who participated who completed both of these um, questionnaires. And then in phase two, um, we had again a questionnaire, a Likert scale with some qualitative enhancements and questions there. And in this case, there was 104 students who participated in the research and our publication accepted. So our article, so I will share the publication with you as soon as it is out for those of you who are interested. But what we found in both of these studies then was that the game really had a meaningful effect on their understanding of plagiarism. Now, um, my students will know, I always have an issue when they say something that students understand something because it is not measurable. So we do not know whether they apply the knowledge, but we at least could see that there is some insight and that they understand the different types of plagiarism and the consequences of plagiarism. So this brings me to what, what I really actually want to share with you today. And that is my 13 tips. So I'm going to go through them and I will spend some time at some of them and others I'll just rush over. And please stop me if I am running out of time. So let us start then with the 13 tips which Terence and I thought was really the things that one needs to focus on when you create a visual novel like this. And this is actually for any type of content that you create for your students. And um, 
we started to say, we need to see which learning objective or learning outcome we want to address. Uh, if, if you create a visual novel or any game-based learning activity for your students and it doesn't address at least one of your learning outcomes, you are not aligned with your curriculum. So this is something I really, really stress is that they need to look at their constructive alignment and which learning outcomes will be addressed by that. And that then links to the second point there is how, do, how will they integrate this interactive novel into their curriculum? Will they use it as an icebreaker to introduce students to the concepts or as a team building activity? Or will they do it halfway through the course somewhere to make sure to reinforce concepts and to share, to understand where the students, and to see where the students understand the concepts? Or, and this is something I really do not recommend, will they use it at the end? We do not want to use these things as a summative assessment because the moment that there is high stake involvement, then we take away the, the niceness, the, the fun, the, the wanting to do this to learn more out of it. So usually I say if there's grading involved in our students reading this novels or and playing the, the game in the novel, that it should be a completion mark, that everyone who completes it gets the mark. So there's not a, a, a B, or C or 80% and a 60%. If you complete the activity and you manage to go home at the end, then you all get the same mark. And that then links to my next um, tip is that when you create this visual novel, that you will know who is your audience. And now I am not only talking about undergraduate, postgraduate, general public who will read your novel, but also the context specific. And that is something that I've learned coming from South Africa, working in Europe. Many of my examples, sometimes if I want to explain Miller's Pyramid, for instance, to the student to see the increase in, com um, in cognitive complexity or skill complexity for, for a person, I would use an example like, um, remember when you, learned to, when you learned how to drive a car? And, and, I, and I will elaborate on that. And at this stage, I realized that very few of my students drive. Very few of my colleagues drive because our transport system is just of such a nature that they do not have to drive. So my examples was really actually irrelevant and didn't make sense to them. So again, if you look here, then if you write your visual novel, who will be your audience? What is their context that you are going to place the story in? And then that links to the scenarios as well. So how will you create your scenarios and your story, your storyline to fit your audience, but also still that it fits in your curriculum and that it address one of your learning outcomes. Then you need to decide how are you going to incorporate your branching in your storyline, in your novel? How complex do you want this branching? Because um, I'll show you after lunch in some of the examples. Some of the examples really go really, really wide and some of them go deep, a little bit more linear. But you need to decide Wow, how many options? Because the more options that there are and the more consequences, the more of a different story you have to write. Um, and I think that is maybe if I can go back to Flora's um, novel that she wrote, that at the end, um, spoiler alert to those of you who still want to read her novel, maybe you must quickly un unplug yourself here. But that the students read it at the end, they asked about... Um, I could say, who was the murderer? Who was the culprit here? And she said, well, that's, the, that's actually the lesson in history. History is in the eye of the beholder. So whoever's point of view you are following, that is your truth. So, um, so you need to decide then when you create your storylines, what would be your truth? What would be your end point? And do you want to bring your novel at the end back together again that although they have traveled far and wide over the internet and over the screen, they all again end at the same place or they end at different places? Are they going to Cape Town or are they going to Bloemfontein? That, that is where, where will they end? 
and linked then to the branchings, branching here is that you as the creator of the novel need to decide which platform you want to use because the platform often also dictates the level of complexity of the branching you want in your novel. Now, I love Google Forms, but if the, if the branching becomes very complex, it's sometimes very difficult to keep track of exactly where your branches are if you do not storyboard it on a different platform first. And that is where um, Storyline 3 or Twine is better because it also provides you at least with a bit of a visual to see where your story is going. Then, and that links to our scenarios as well as to our branches that we are creating, you need to find a balance between the skills and the challenges and the complexity in your novel. You want your students to have the critical thinking and develop the critical thinking skills, but you need to make it in such a way that they, that they have the potential to complete the novel. You don't want them to stop halfway through your novel and not play further, not read further, and then you don't reach your objective that you wanted to reach. So one of our recommendations is then if you start your novel and you start with some of your challenges and skills, that you start with one or two easier ones to ease your student into the novel, to make it fun, for, to make it nice for them. And this is the same principle when we develop assessments for our students. If you um, create an exam or a test for your students, we always, hopefully, start with one or two easier questions to set the student at ease and to just do some of the stress reduction and then get them into the assessment or into the exam. And the same with a novel. You don't want to start with something so complex and so difficult that they just say, no, this, this is just too much. We, we cannot do this and that they opt out of the novel. Then we definitely want to develop some of our transferable skills in our students when they read the novel. So we do not want to focus only on content and context, but also on things like critical thinking, problem solving, and if applicable, communication, and those skills as well. So you need to think carefully how will you incorporate that in your novel and if we think of things like critical skill where we want uh, our participant or our student to be able to identify with someone to literally not literally figuratively so walk in their shoes to experience what they are experiencing to experience the frustration and the sadness or the excitement or the joy so how will you create that thing in your novel to to do that as well and then one of the very very important things for me in creating these visual novels is then the immediate feedback you don't want your student to do this interactive novel and I'm going to use a game-based learning or playing the game or reading the novel as synonyms, because in this case it is. But you don't want them to play the game or read the novel and come to the end and then they say, well, this is now too sad because um, somewhere in the beginning you made a mistake and your patient died. Or, um, sorry, the bridge collapsed, um, Mr. Engineer, because you made a calculation mistake somewhere there or whatever your example is. So you want your student or your participant or your reader, as they go through, if they answer something less optimal, less correct, let's not say necessarily wrong, but less correct, that there is a prompt, an answer to say, not necessarily the best option or best choice, but you've made this choice now. You ate the chocolate while you were on diet, so now you have to have the consequences, but you must remember. It was not a good thing to eat the chocolate. So let's continue. Let's try to not eat the chocolate again or whatever, if I can use these ridiculous examples. Now, link to the feedback as well, and we want to make these feedback also teachable moments for our students, is something that I also, I feel strongly about a lot of things here, but also feel strongly about is the debriefing at the end of the novel or of the game that the students play. The, this is something, if you look at literature, that they say this is a very often neglected part of um, game-based learning or of these interactive novels, and you have to purpose fully plan on how will you do the debriefing for your students or your participants 
after this. So how will you get them together or individually and help them then to bracket this or to finalize this and then move on? And again, that depends on how severe or how serious your game is. If I think of um, in health sciences, where we have patient scenarios, where they read the interactive novel, where the patient has a heart attack and you do some interventions, you give medication and things, and you made a few bad decisions and the patient died. So how do you do a debriefing to say, okay, in future, when it's a real patient, what would be better? How, how, how would you feel when it happens in real life and talk to your um, participants or your students through that? And again, this is not only related to um, the health sciences. Then, if there's a possibility, it's always nice if you can incorporate a collaborative element. And that depends, again, on how you structure your, your game. Is it a single player? Or do you want them to play in teams of two, three, four, or how many, or read in teams of three or four, so that they can soundboard against one another and negotiate and debate and unpack the concept and th that there's some space for peer teaching and peer learning as well. And then to see, okay, I've convinced my teammates now that this is the correct option, and then the answer comes and it's not. So how do I man up? person up to the consequences of my decision that I really strongly felt was correct and now it is not. So how do you incorporate that into your um, novel or in your game? Then the next one, and these two are really closely linked to one another, is how much of the, inter of the um, visual components of the multimedia do you want to include in your game? Um, which was actually funny if I think of the game that I've showed you now, the anti-plagiarism game, where some of the respondents said, you know, the images are really, really basic. You could have done better. No, they are 2D, they are flat. You could have made with um, AI not much nicer images. Uh, but it was a purposeful decision that we made that we didn't want to. But yeah, how, how much of the multimedia do you want to include here? And if you think back of the 15 principles, of Maya's 15 principles of using multimedia, to see how do you balance that to prevent cognitive overload, that the content that you put in your novel on that specific page has relevance without distracting and without overloading the reader of that page. And linked to the multimedia is then um, our accessibility. Now, not all of the platforms are geared towards accessibility. I was very impressed to see that um, Google Forms and actually Twine lately also have an alt text for your images that you can describe it so that a screen reader can read it. So this is maybe something when you dis decide on your platform to also look at that if this is something that you want to look at and most of our universities have a focus on inclusivity and uh, accessibility and different abilities of our students so do spend some time and maybe look at that as well then the second last one and um, this is something that the you learn after a while you test it you play it the links work everything is fine you publish it and the moment you open it there's a spelling mistake on page two or page one or one of the links doesn't work or the link is broken so this is really something that i want to encourage you ask your friends ask your family ask them to play the game for you i have family that says no nah, that, that's just too much. And then I've got my sister that says, this was wrong and this was wrong and it didn't size here and I had to scroll up and down. And this was unpleasant to, to play. And those are really, really valuable feedback because that is how your students feel. So ask your critics, your, the people that is the harshest on you, ask them to look at your novel, to read it, to give you feedback and incorporate the feedback where appropriate. And then maybe the last of my 13 tips is to supplement and not replace. Now, this is a, a, a very interesting statement because I usually tell the lecturers, if you put something in your curriculum, you need to take something out. 
You cannot keep on adding. Our curriculums and our programs are already credit heavy. It's already overloaded. So you can't, cannot keep on adding and adding and adding. But in this case, I will really recommend that you do not take out the textbook or, or replace your lecture with this interactive novel. Because this is still a relatively new concept and we want our students to get used to this, but we do not want to um, disadvantage the students that do not learn this way. So in this case, as I said, I will really go for supplement and not necessarily replace, which is a difficult thing for me to say. <laughs> Okay, so there are my 13 tips. I think there are much more to it than these tips. And um, when I do my workshops on game-based learning, I have an entire workbook that the, that the participants complete where they start with the narrative and their hook and the different challenges. and the, So they uh, storyboard it in this document. And then from there on, they storyboard it on a different platform as well. But that is a separate, separate workshop and a separate activity. This is when you start to, to think about your visual novel and how do you then plan it for your students. And that, in short, is then our visual novels. And I hope that obviously all of us that are here today are interested in games, some of us in much more serious games. And... Um, I hope that we will use this game-based learning really as a spark to ignite the fire in our students for their learning, to show them that learning doesn't necessarily have to be a 300-word textbook or 55 articles that they have to read. So thank you very much for everything. Thank you for listening. Thank you for um, hopefully considering creating something like this. And then maybe as a little bit of an ad, after lunch, um, I am going to take you through Twine. That is the platform that the students use to create their two novels, the one of the Ottoman history and the Crusaders. And I am going to take you through basic, really, really basic Twine. Not complex. So the complex things we will leave for another time. This is for someone who has no, no programming background, that doesn't know how to program. This is for you. So we will then see how do we create our first part of our interactive novel. So, in Afrikaans, flight, flight, my story is out. Any questions, any concerns? Angus, you've got a hand. And then Maria, I think. I don't know if the participants have access to their mics. Guess. Otherwise, I will quickly try to see if I can find the chat, the q and A. I don't. I don't. Yes. I can see a question. Uh, oh, please. The chat. Uh, the question from Angus is: uh, Hi. Uh, are there any difference between the suitability of different types of scenarios to this format? For example, historical narratives uh, versus scenarios that encourage modeling of behavior. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. That is a interesting and a difficult question. So not all topics are, real, are um, suitable for game-based learning. Um, things like um, gender-based violence, those will, I will definitely not do a game-based learning, but I can do a, a novel that have choices um, on that. So I will definitely look at the, the content before I decide, will I game if, make it fun and games and lightness in the sense of, ah, oh, there, the rock falls on your head, or, oh, now you're out of coffee, something like that, or in the case of something like gender-based violence or life, um, end of life choices, I would definitely go into a much more serious um, novel approach. Um, and again, the scenarios there, the base, the, the branching of the scenarios, then again depends on the severity of the consequences that you want to teach the students. With a historical narrative, 
uh, in the case of Flora and Juan Manuel, they, their narratives are historically correct. So that's, uh, as I said, that's part of the literature chapter in the dissertations. So it is accurate, it's research-based, um, all the facts are correct. Yeah, it is like when you read a book and then they make a movie of the book and they put some extra lights and bells and whistles in it. So if the an historical facts didn't say and then she gasped for air when she talked about it, they added that type of flair in it. But um, I still think both are suitable. You just need to decide how what is the learning you want your students to acquire? What is the what is the learning outcome you want to achieve here? So I hope that long answer <laughs> um, answered the question. Any last questions? I think I've got a few minutes more, but I otherwise I'm going to hand over to Maria that she can start a screen sharing and everything. Because I know how <laughs> horrible that is if you have to start late. Going, going. Okay. Then thank you, very, thank you very much, anyone. And if you want to reach out, you are really welcome to reach out to either Terence or me. We love to collaborate either individually or as a team. And yeah, see you again after lunch. Thank you, Maria. The mic is yours. Thank you very much. Um, yes, and first of all, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to this wonderful event. I am very, very excited to participate and to collaborate and uh, to, um, yeah, to, to, to address some of the issues together with colleagues who are also interested in gaming. And I also wanted to say that I feel a lot of pressure now. <laughs> uh just presenting after iran because like uh i am a student uh of iran and uh i yes so now i now i feel a lot of pressure just to uh just just to just with presenting my my first experience with uh implementing a game uh for my students from uh sociology uh from sociological uh from sociological theory course so uh just a few words about the course it is designed for ba students uh it is building on classical sociological theory called contemporary sociological theory and it is uh like a basic course for the sociology for major sociology students and it aims to introduce students to 20th century sociological theories uh, requiring extensive uh, lecturing, reading, memorizing. So the tasks that, stu that students often find um, unappealing, to say, uh, to, uh, to say at least. So my challenge was to develop a game to facilitate a recall of the theories and discussed in the first module and uh, aid students to in comparing and preparing for concept mapping that scaffolds the theories, encouraging them to compare and contrast several theorists that were previously studied, uh, covered in this course in isolation. So week by week, uh, one week after another. So um, just a brief, um, just a brief, uh, by the way, do you see the presentation and the change of slides? I hope you do. Yes, yes, we do. Yes, yes, very good. So, um, let me, yeah, let me do this smaller for me to make it a little bit more comfortable. Yes. So, uh, I would like to start with uh, a little introduction to the challenges for teaching sociological theory, just a little bit. So, um, all sociologists, I think, would agree that uh, studying sociological theory is a crucial component for the intellectual development of students, uh, especially of stu uh, for students of sociology. And sociology majors uh, learn that sociological theory is foundational for our field, as theories frame the way we look at the problems, the way what we count uh, as problems, and uh, they provide also the guiding questions for our social inquiry. We can even say that the questions we ask presuppose the answers we uh, get. However, despite these uh, crucial importance of sociological theory to uh, sociology majors, it is a very complicated task to teach sociology uh, sociological theory course. 
First of all, because of the abstractness and complexity of theoretical ideas, students often find uh, sociological theories to be abstract, dense, confusing, very difficult to understand and relate to the concepts. And theoretical ideas appear to be uh, disconnected from practical skills that students, as they believe, are directly trans uh, translatable. Uh, the students believe to, uh, to be the directly translatable to job opportunities. So students basically believe that they do not need these sociological, these sociology theory courses uh, and sociological theories to, um, yes, to find a good job, uh, a good high paid job. And uh, again, students may be anxious uh, and uh, feel dis uh, and feel disconnected from theories. And there also is a prevalent uh, theory and uh, anxiety among students. Uh, yes, as identified by Loni, so students basically feel apprehensive and uh, again disconnected from theory courses, and uh, they view them usually as dry, abstract, less relevant, and they actually faced uh, troubles with connecting uh, their um, uh, the concept that we study, the theories that we study, and their personal experience. So this application is also a challenge uh, for students. And um, of course, abstract and dense readings. You cannot teach sociological theory without uh, teaching students how to read and without reading a lot of difficult texts. So um, all of these problems that usually are faced by different sociology, uh, sociology teachers, te uh, sociology theory instructors are um, contributing to the lack of motivation of students to learn sociological theory. And this game, the game that uh, I want to present to you now, was designed to address these challenges of lack of motivation and disengagement uh, with theory courses. So I want students to relax a little bit and to uh, feel the connection between theory and uh, show them that, th that theory can be fun. How to change the slide? Yes. So let us start with exploring the game design. First of all, uh, this game was developed as part of the game-based learning course by Professor Iren. Uh, and this game uh, is based on Twine, uh, conducted on twinery.org, and uh, it, it emphasizes the teamwork. It is a team game with a, random, uh, with a random assignment of roles, and you can see that here we have the role of the leader, those who is responsible for the decisions, especially when there are some disagreements in the team, the librarian who is responsible for collecting, uh, for, for, for searching the different resources because students are allowed to use any resources that they want during this game. So they can use lecture notes, lecture slides, uh, Google, uh, GPT even, so whatever. So librarian is the person who is responsible for uh, this, um, for this uh, uh, search. Storyteller is uh, a student who, uh, who is responsible for reading out loud the, the, the prompts, so reading out loud the passages of text that are uh, used to um, introduce the students to the plot of the game. And uh, the role of the timekeeper. The timekeeper is responsible for uh, like accounting for, for accounting for time. How many time they have already spent doing these challenges, and how many time they, and how much time they will need to complete uh, complete the game. And uh, this is a textual game uh, with a detective plot. I actually like to think of the work of a sociologist uh, like a work of the detective, and therefore I designed these as uh, also a detective uh, uh, called the mystery of a stolen manuscript. So it begins with a random role assignment via the fortune wheel that you can see here. And uh, then it leads students to a fictional sociological conference with the prominent theorists, uh, the ones that we studied uh, during the first module. And envisioning the work of sociologists as a detective work, the game provides students with a challenge to find out who is the um, who is responsible for stealing the sociological manuscript. Uh, and uh, yes, they are invited to um, 
basically compare the handwriting of the different theorists to uh, identify uh, to identify uh, the person who is responsible for that. And this uh, like plot leads us to the general discussion on the importance of sociological canon. While uh, so, when the game is finished, we engage in the group discussion whether we should preserve sociological canon or whether there are some opportunities to change sociological canon. So this game is kind of the uh, preparation step for the general discussion. So. Here I wanted just to uh, show you the uh, one of the slides of the game. So uh, it starts like this, and here you can see the AI generated pictures. So I do this uh, like AI generation to make it more um, appealing to students, more interactive, and also I uh, have tried to uh, AI generate the portraits of the theorists because theorists are kind of real people, and therefore I try to AI generate uh, their, their images as they would appear in this uh, sociological conference, fictional sociological conference. Uh, so the game adopts the behaviorist approach uh, with uh, memorization-focused tasks designed to foster collaborative problem solving among students. And uh, it features uh, six types of tasks that were uh, using the World Wall uh, app to streamline like their experiences to integrate these uh, challenges inside the inside Twine to avoid using different websites. And uh, yeah, six types of challenges: quizzes, word searches, crosswords, label diagrams, matchups, and fill in the blanks. I will show you some of these games. Uh, some of the uh, some of these games um, in the forthcoming slides, and uh, this game was uh, was kind of aimed at uh, um, at fostering students uh, to remember key sociological theories and concepts and theorists that were studied during the first module of the course and differentiate between uh, these several theoretical approaches and the wider sociological paradigms. So again, the challenges that I wanted to address was to juxtapose theories simultaneously, because previously we studied theories one by one. One week was devoted, for example, to structural functionalism, and the next week was devoted, for example, to symbolic interactionism. And they were never compared previously during the, uh, during the first module. This uh, on this slide you can see the uh, like first challenge, uh, the uh, uh, the label diagrams. So here students are invited to uh, connect the example with the particular uh, with a particular um, function that uh, that it can play in theory of Tolkien Parsons. Here you can see uh, another example. Uh, a challenge is uh, this fill in the blanks. So students are invited to uh, suggest what word can be uh, used by Alfred Schutz. And uh, here, for example, students uh, are invited to, students are supposed to uh, search for the words search for the words that are uh, encrypted in this uh, in, in this challenge and the words that they should search for are uh, like the definitions for these words uh, for these words are uh, presented here and you can see that uh, these challenges they uh, allow multiple submissions and what is even more important about these uh, multiple submissions is that after each of the submission, it is evaluated, it is uh, checked, and the students are presented with the results. So they, uh, so these challenges are used to uh, for them to just know the correct answer, the correct uh, answer that they would be later invited to type in or to choose uh, out of the suggested options. Uh, a few words about implementation. So the game is stored as an HTML file and was integrated into our like e-course system, which is also powered by Moodle. Uh, and it, it, may, it made the game accessible from a laptop of one of the team members and accessible for, from our course page. So basically, students just opened opened our course page and uh, they can, ac uh, they can uh, access this game. 
and uh, by the way, the game is of course available for all students, even those who did not attend the session, and they can uh, like participate in this game after uh, after the session, uh, just accessing this uh, from their own laptops at home. So uh, as I planned. One session uh, during the midterm week would be devoted to uh, playing this game. And uh, during this uh, session, I had seven students and I divided them in two groups uh, uh, with three and four students. And I also applied pre and post game testing. Uh, pre and post game testing to evaluate their knowledge of sociological concepts and theories before and after the game. This test included uh, 10 questions and half of them addressed the content of the game directly. So these were the uh, like directly uh, directly used in the challenges that uh, students were invited to uh, invited to solve. For example, you previously uh, on the previous slide you uh, saw the challenge um, by Alfred Schutz, and uh, yeah, the 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 word uh, in the minology and this word, for example, was directly uh, addressed in one of the questions of the test. And half uh, of these questions, five of, of these questions were not directly connected uh, with the content of the game. So they were, of course, connected with the course content, but uh, they were not directly addressed in the challenges uh, in this game. And uh, yes, and I wanted to uh, estimate whether the game was helpful, not only to reconnect and uh, like recall the uh, issues addressed in the game, but improve the general understanding of students of the course content. So I plan to see if the game is helpful in general, not only to memorize the uh, addressed concepts. And um, now, a few words about the uh, assessment, this pre and post game testing. So I understand that this is not statistic <laughs> and uh, I cannot have these kind of statistical methods out of seven students, but still I wanted to kind of evaluate the, uh, the success or failure of the game. So I have seen that the results of the students, of, of uh, the students has improved in general. Uh, the average score of the correct analysis also has raised from uh, 6.7 to 8.4 out of 10. And four students uh, managed to reach 90% rate of the correct answers. Uh, I also can tell that the game was particularly beneficial for students who initially struggled, those who uh, had lower scores, uh, lower scores during the uh, pre-game testing. In three cases, uh, there were there was an improvement in the questions that are directly addressed in the game, and uh, in two cases, the improvement also included questions that were not directly addressed in the challenges of the game. So, in two cases, I can see the improvement, uh, the improvement of the kind of general knowledge, so to say. And in two cases, there was uh, no improvement. In one uh, case, it was because uh, of the reached maximum. So the student uh, scored maximum points uh, for both pre and post game testing. And for uh, and as for the second one, uh, this was kind of a little bit surprising case for me. 90% uh, rate of the correct answers during the pre-game testing actually uh, reduced to 80% uh, of the correct uh, answers during the post-game testing. So actually the results, uh, the results were uh, worse than before. Actually, I do not know why. Um, I also collected the students' feedback to see if the, to see how they evaluate the game. So during the game itself, I can see that they were, uh, I, I could see that they were laughing, that they were uh, discussing something with each other and they were really engaged, even those who uh, are usually uh, silent, uh, yes, and silent and uh, who usually is uh, like limited in their participation. 
so yes, I also included the student's feedback form uh, on our e-course page. And uh, by the way, I can um, like have in an, an indirect measure of our uh, like of, of this game of this game uh, evaluation by students is that all of them actually or six of them actually filled in this feedback form uh if like uh taking into account that it was uh like it was to be filled at home and i could not control uh them uh like while filling this form so basically six of them actually filled the form uh to deliver their feedback so uh in general this game uh was uh yes the the general experience the overall experience of the game uh was like the general feedback was positive over overwhelmingly positive and in some cases flattering i would say uh and all students evaluated their overall experience of the game as uh seven so giving the maximum points to their experience uh also the game was rated as uh rather interesting and uh rather helpful with the course content so uh most of the students evaluated is uh, it as very helpful also, uh, I compared uh, the subjective estimates of the knowledge of uh, the course content before and after the game. So uh, before the game, students actually um, evaluate, subjectively evaluated their knowledge um, very diverse, I would say, with the, uh, with the, mean, uh, with the mean score uh, 5.17. Uh, 5 before the game. And after the game, their subjective estimates improved to uh, 6.33. So basically, uh, the majority of them, four students, evaluated their knowledge uh, of the course content, their understanding of the course content after the game uh, as six, almost, almost perfect. And here is also some of the uh, like students' answers to the uh, to my open-ended questions. So uh, they highlighted the uh, a strong sides of the game. They highlighted the variety of assignments, the variety of challenges, and uh, the visual tools I used. These AI-generated pictures, and some of them also uh, emphasized the story. So the the, the plot uh, the plot itself. And um, among the things that they wanted to change, they also named uh, these, uh, like all of them actually, uh, actually mentioned the standardization of the answers. So how the way how the answers should be typed in to to pass uh, to pass and to uh, go further in this game because we really faced uh, we really faced the problem in this. Um, I also conducted the self-evaluation and uh, let me first start with the challenges that I identify for myself implementing this game. First of all, the time limit. Contrary to my estimates, it took students almost an hour to complete the game. Uh, first of all, uh, because of the answers, uh, because that uh, because the answer submission was complicated because of the different rules of answer submission. So uh, unfortunately, we spent a lot of time uh, on the first challenge, I, I would say in the first challenge because of the difficulties, difficulties in submissions, te technical difficulties. The first technical difficulty was that uh, it required students to type in the full, uh, like the full, um, uh, the, the full title of the uh, full title of the concept and they typed in the short name so basically not latent pattern man, uh, maintenance but latency and this discrepancy actually cost us a lot of time and uh, this Moodle platform so the e-course page to uh, which it was automatically integrated it doesn't allow using the full screen for embedded html documents so it resulted in the smaller screen for the whole game for the end for the challenges so uh, as you could see on the previous slide there was an option also to uh, have the full screen for challenges but for the pictures for the text it was just the uh, just the uh, 
just the I would say eighty percent of the planned uh, of the planned scale of the of, of the game. Uh, also, what was uh, like challenging for me is that one team actually finished uh, significantly earlier than the other team. And uh, the first team actually, uh, like I, the, the teams were uh, formed almost randomly, but I ensured that each team would have uh, at least one strong student, at least one strong student. So a student that uh, performed great during the first module that is known for his uh, or her great performance. So uh, the smaller team actually finished the game earlier than the larger team. The team of three students finished earlier. And I, can, and I could see that uh, the team that finished later, they actually read the uh, text, uh, the plot very attentively. So they, uh, divide, uh, so they derived a lot of attention to the, to the plot. Probably it is because of that. Probably uh, it is uh, probably this uh, like difficulty is uh, caused by this uh, increased attention to 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 the text. And the problem for me was that uh, when the first uh, team has finished, I actually had nothing, uh, had no idea what to do with them. So I cannot engage them with a discuss in a discussion because the second team is still in the middle of the process, and uh, I cannot uh, just let them go home because, like, we still have to uh, have the group discussion. And it was yes, it was a little bit complicated for me. I didn't expect the students. Uh, I didn't expect the teams to finish in uh, such a different with such a difference in time, and. Because of the waste of time, because of the significant waste of time uh, during these technical issues uh, of uh, with uh, with answer submission, there was a uh, lack of time for, lack of time for group discussion. So I planned that we will engage in the group discussion about the importance of the sociological canon and uh, whether we should preserve it or transform it or reject it or uh, what are the options of uh, like developing this canon and. Due to this, uh, like uh, due to this mistake in the uh, in the answer submission, like my mistake as the game designer, uh, yes, we have wasted a lot of time, and I think the uh, final, uh, the the ending of the game was a little bit messed up. And uh, to uh, highlight some of the. Uh, areas for future improvements i would uh yeah i would say that i should announce and uh yeah i should announce the number of challenges that students will face in this game to help them to account for their time because i think if they would have known that they are to face six challenges they would ask for my help earlier than they did uh when they encountered uh the first uh, the first problem with this answer submission and also, uh, I should provide uh, better and clearer instructions for each task, for each task to help uh, students to understand how the answer should be typed in, uh, and maybe uh, multiple ways to write a correct answer. So I am not very familiar with the uh, twine uh, with the twine tools. So I basically do not know how to uh, do not know yet how to. Uh, uh, allow multiple multiple ways to write a correct answer. And uh, what is also uh, important is to invite students to test the integrated world world challenges during one of the previous classes to make them more technically equipped because some of the time was uh, lost due to these uh, technical unfamiliarity. And also uh, the game opened differently for students with Windows and for students with Mac. And students with Windows had a clearer picture than students with Mac. Uh, and therefore, this was kind of inequality. <laughs> and uh, students with Mac, they have spent some time to uh, figure out how to have the challenge on the full screen. So basically, if they have this uh, opportunity to test the world world challenges uh, previously, I think they would not have uh, lose their time here. Uh, and, 
yeah, so in all, I actually evaluate the experience of implementation of this game very positively. I think it helps students to relax before the forthcoming uh, midterm exam. And actually, it has successfully prepared them to uh, the uh, to, uh, to creating the mind maps. So our second task on this midterm week was create the mind map of the theories. And uh, this game actually prepared students to do this activity. Also, I would say that uh, this is a nice uh, instrument for uh, recalling some of the some of the concepts, but it should not be used for evaluation of the students' knowledge. So I did. Uh, so I basically did not evaluate uh, this. I did not grade this, but students received some prizes for uh, completing the game. Actually, both teams uh, received some prizes from me after the completing uh, the game. So, uh, yes, and also uh, while comparing the results of those students who attended the game, who completed the game, and those who didn't, I would say that it appears that the first group, those who attended the game, had uh, higher scores uh, on the midterm exam than those who did not. However, it may be also uh, like it may be also caused by their uh, more often pre uh, more regular present presence in class. So probably they did it better because they were actually more present in class and therefore they uh, managed to uh, achieve higher scores for their midterm exam. Uh, yeah, so Lenol, it was a very, a very uh, interesting tool and it was a very interesting experience to implement this game. And uh, I actually even regret that uh, this game cannot be repeated more often. So I wanted to uh, improve it, to integrate these improvements and, uh, and repeat it with my students. But I have to wait <laughs> several weeks. Uh, and I plan also to develop a similar game uh, to summarize the content of the set. Uh, of the second module of the course uh, before the final exam of this uh, sociological theory course. Yes, I think that's all. Thank you very much for your attention and I will be happy to answer any questions if you, yes, if you have any. Thank you, thank you. Oh, uh, the question. Yes, I, I can see, William, you have the, uh, the the answer raised. That's right. Sure. I've learned such a lot from Dr. Irina from you. You can't believe it. It's wonderful. Thank you for the presentations. I just want to find out, um, maybe I missed it. Um, you were talking about the students playing the game on um, the computers and not on the uh, mobile devices. Is there any possibility for them to play it on the mobile devices or is it impossible for them? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. I think this is a, yes, this is a great one. I actually did not test uh, the, uh, so there is no technical, um, there is no technical, uh, so to say, barriers towards uh, against playing this on the uh, on the mobile uh, phones but i should test whether it appears correctly whether the challenges are accessible and you can see that some of the challenges they appear too small and it is very hard to read uh like the uh, to read the prompts to read the description and therefore uh usually i think i actually planned that students will access this uh from their personal laptops because usually students come with their laptops and we need at least one laptop for the whole team so the whole team uses one, only one laptop thanks a lot i appreciate mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I am ready to uh, give the floor to the, uh, yeah, to the forthcoming uh, members, participants. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adarqua, are you ready? <laughs> Hello, greetings to everyone. Yeah, I'm happy to 
be invited uh, to present uh, this webinar symposium. And my thanks to uh, Professor William Oliver for extending this invitation. I collaborated with some researchers at the Small Learning Institute of Beijing Oma University in China. And I would like to share my uh, study or our results with you. I followed this, uh, just the past presentation closely, and I like the latter part of the discussion about playing games on different devices like computers or mobile devices, because my presentation is focused on uh, playing games on mobile devices. So we look at the effect of educational mobile games on learning performance. Um, I will share the study on the chat group. Uh, it was recently published. So we look at uh, games in general as we are discussing serious games, games that focuses more about uh, improving learning or cognition uh, instead of uh, entertainment. So we focus on game on mobile devices, playing games on mobile devices, because now um, we have different learning environments, different learning spaces, and researchers, they are even Makers in education, game designers, they are all focusing on how to uh, utilize different learning space or environment to promote immersive learning experiences that will help in pro problem solving and also promote cognition and other uh, areas uh, of uh, educational or academic performance, all for career goals. So we focus on mobile gaming, um, which drives on uh, M learning. So I'll be discussing more about that. So we conducted a meta-analysis and research centers of some studies we extracted from uh, electronic uh, databases. So we have, uh, as we talk about games, we cannot uh, talk about games or overlook its addictiveness uh, because we have different types of games. I remember when I was a child, I was engaged in a lot of gameplay. Uh, mostly not at school, but at home. And uh, there had to be someone watching me so that I don't get addicted. So there is even a time limit for me to play game and then concentrate on my studies. So we have a lot of games now. Um, so when we, uh, we, when we talk about games, what are the, ed the uh, educational value of games? And also what about the addictiveness? How do we find the balance? How do we ensure that gameplay really results in uh, promoting education, not just for pleasure? There are times you utilize games for pleasure, for entertainment, but at the same time, what skills, knowledge, or uh, your insights in terms of uh, educational value can we gain from some of these games? Because even in education, there is a concept about gamification where game rules are implemented into learning or integrated into the school curriculum or model that we use for our students. And the uh, main aim is to make education more something like entertainment, you know, bring some entertaining aspect or game rules uh, in learning uh, while at the same time focusing on the main mission of the school, which is promoting academic excellence among students. So as we talk about games, we cannot overlook its addictiveness. So we have to try to find a balance to ensure that the true educational value uh, of in, uh, implementing gaming uh, in learning is uh, really uh, gotten. So uh, as I'm talking about mobile games, um, you know, mobile games thrives on M learning because uh, we utilize mobile devices for um, educational purposes now. Now, there have been different generation of uh, mobile phones. We have the first generation, the 1G, which mostly when it was out for voice calls, then 2G allow text messages. We have the 3G mobile devices, which also allow us to access the internet. And the 4G gives us a lot of multimedia experiences and fast internet. And now we are in the 5G era or the fifth generation era, which also have different multimodal uh, experiences for 
users and also fast internet connection. So mobile learning or M learning is primarily using mobile devices for educational or academic purposes. And um, they can be used to give some contextual uh, information or contextual experience or personalized experience or customized experience. As I was talking about different learning space and environments. Now, researchers are looking to personalize learning, uh, adaptive learning, seamless learning for different kinds of learners, adults, early childhood, uh, different kinds of learners, just to personalize learning, make learning more adapt adaptive and customized. Because when learning is tailor-made for students, is uh because of they have different learning styles promotes uh good academic performance. So mobile learning or using mobile devices for learning, it, uh, it promotes in classroom. You know, you can learn inside the classroom and also outside the classroom. No matter where you are, as I talk about seamless learning, no matter where you are, you can use mobile devices for learning. So in a way, it is promoting ubiquitous. Uh, learning, which is learning anywhere and also at any time. And it can be used in formal and informal settings. So um, like in an organized educational institution or an organization, uh, it could be used even workplace learning. People use mobile devices for workplace learning. And also informal learning environments, just outside your corridor, museums, uh, in nature, you can also use uh, mobile devices for accessing educational content over the internet. So mobile learning uh, promotes uh, both classroom learning experience and also outside uh, classroom and different learning settings. You can also use mobile devices for educational purposes. And they are important or uh, used a lot nowadays because they are portable and they have access to uh, internet, the connectivity levels are high. As I mentioned, we are in the fifth generation. So if you are, no matter your ge geographic location, if you are connected to the internet, you can access educational resources over the internet. Now, UNESCO and other uh, organizations are promoting open educational resources and different learning resources, e-libraries, they are all around where now you can just use your mobile devices and you can access all of so the portability and the connectivity levels uh, they are some of the reasons or factors why educators or researchers are calling for the implementation of uh, m learning in education so we have different types of uh, learning we have the e learning m learning different flexible learning hybrid learning they are all concepts which are in a way interrelated and also it promotes good social interactions. Uh, now we have the social media, all the social media like Facebook, YouTube, they can be used for entertainment purposes or accessing just casual information or information from the news media. They can, there are also groups and pages and information which are mostly academic in nature. So as you surf through the internet or use some of these social medias, you can also gain some kind of skills or knowledge uh, from some of these social media. And as I talked about uh, personalized learning, customized learning or adaptive learning, uh, mobile devices also promote individuality because if I'm with my phone, I can just be present and learn at my own pace. So it promotes good social interactivity and also individuality, good communication. I can use it for voice calls, uh, do a voice recording and send to, if we have like a group, uh, maybe a WhatsApp group, I can just send a voice note or something. So even in some of these platform, gaming can happen, even in a form of pools and other uh, way we can use uh, gaming rules uh, in learning. So when we talk about educational games, most research studies, uh, we observe that they are talking about educational games in general, or they are focusing on maybe just computer games. So why not look at mobile games? Why not leverage mobile devices with powerful features to create educational mobile games that can offer engaging and effective learning experience? So this 
a very good question. And based on this question, a lot of mobile devices have been developed. Uh, some have been developed or customized mainly for learning. And uh, we have our own phones where you can download some educational learning experience uh, apps like Duolingo for language learning and all that. So we can leverage the powerful features of mobile devices uh, for learning. And based on that, a lot of mobile games have been uh, developed. A lot of mobile devices and applications have been developed. So educational mobile games um, com combine both play and learning uh, through engagement techniques. So as I mentioned earlier, for gamification, you are just combining uh, you are just implementing gaming rules in education just to make education more fun and uh, entertaining but at the same time not losing the core value of education so you are just uh, focusing on play and learn just to achieve uh, educational objective and it has been highlighted by some of these researchers cited here that it improves the acquisition of skills uh, and also knowledge and additionally, uh, it has also been highlighted to improve learning outcomes of uh, students. So most uh, the core value, although education, education is they have their missions and uh, visions, but the core value is to promote because teachers and students, uh, they are maybe uh, key stakeholders in education, administrators, human, source, uh, human resource, and other people, they play important role. But the core value of educational institution is to make people literate, uh, promote or pro, uh, provide literate citizens for the country, people equipped uh, with skills uh, which is needed in the workforce or labor force. So students and teachers play integral role. So how can games or mobile devices, playing games or mobile devices promote learning performance? Some studies have, have highlighted, they have conducted, uh, they have done investigation and they found that uh, it improves learning performance. And by improving learning performance, it enhances critical thinking skills. As I mentioned about uh, apps like Duolingo, there are even IELTS and TOEFL uh, apps that all promote uh, language development. And even when you go to the health sector, there are also apps uh, which also helps uh, for maybe learning for NCLEs uh, and other stuff. So it also promotes uh, attention like because if you are playing games, you are focused on the games. You want to up your level. You want to compete with uh, <laughs> other players in the games and also uh, yeah, get to a higher level uh, in terms of the game. So you are focused uh, on the game. So in a way, it stimulates uh, attention such that if you gain this attention, if you are given a tax, your attention is on that tax. And when game player being introduced into learning, you also want to compete with other students or colleagues uh, on that. And all this enhances the memory and problem solving skills. For example, if there is a game, maybe you need to go and cut a wood uh, at a place, but there are uh, hurdles. So you need to find a very good path uh, or a very easy route uh, to, if there is time, like in a marathon or uh, for uh, athletes, those who run a race, you want the shortcuts and the easiest route to get to get the wood and bring it uh, to the finish line or your home. So all of this enhances uh, problem solving skills and uh, memory. So gameplay is important, but at the same time, as I started with uh, the addictiveness, we need to find uh, the balance. Uh, so do educational games really make a difference and are they with the effort? Uh, some past studies have highlighted that, but if you won't really want to look at this study. Why also not look at mobile devices? There are tons of study about the impact of educational games. What about mobile games? And we, when we talk about mobile games, there are different types of mobile devices. Which mobile device is very good for playing a specific games? Because there are different genre of games, action games, adventure games, simulation games, puzzle games, 
different types of games. So there are a lot of factors that comes into play when we are talking about educational mobile games or using mobile devices or M learning for uh, uh, for uh, gaming purposes in education. So most studies look at uh, gaming in general without looking at mobile games. And when they look at mobile games, they are not looking at different factors, which I will mention about. So past studies, they look at trends, advantages, and challenges of uh, educational games and sometimes educational mobile games in education. So this particular researchers look at STEM education. So how can educational games, uh, their impact be felt when we are talking about STEM education? Some also look at uh, language uh, learning, uh, science learning. So all of these uh, studies have looked at specific areas. Why not look at general education or different categories of education like the arts and humanities, the sciences, the all that. Why don't we look at that? So that is uh, what our study was trying to uh, fill or a gap that we we're trying to fill. So this particular research has also found that digital games, they are effective for mathematics, uh, science and language learning, but not other subjects. So it calls us to look at gaming uh, for uh, using different types of games, using uh, mobile devices or gaming in different learning settings and uh, their uh, environment. So our studies, as I've highlighted, past studies look at STEM, language education, science education. So we try to fill uh, this gap. So educational mobile games should not be treated as a black box. Like you have a box, you know what goes around it. You know, maybe somebody takes something from the box and give it to you, but you don't really know the internal processes that occurs for maybe something for the box to be alive or to be uh, being seated there or planted there and what really occurs inside the box. So in general, we know that educational games, educational mobile games, they all promote learning, but there are several factors. I have mentioned some of them that we have to look at. So we should not just treat it as a blackboard. So our investigation, we are looking at educational mobile games on learning performance. At the same time, because of different factors, we wanted to know um, their effects, uh, like variation in effect in terms of educational level, the bachelor level, master's level, doctoral level, early childhood. We wanted to look at that variation according to mobile device. As I've mentioned, there are different types of mobile device, which I will come to that. And also variation in terms of field ed of education. There are different sectors or fields or disciplines that we also have to look at. Variation in terms of intervention period. How long should a game be played or how long should students be exposed to games? So our study, we, as I mentioned, we did a research synthesis and meta-analysis. So we used the RESMA approach where we extracted uh, data or uh, studies literature from different electronic databases like Web of Science and Scopus and other uh, electronic databases. So for our research, we look at studies from 2013 to 2023 and those published in English uh, these are just our inclusion and exclusion criteria. So what we really wanted to look at was the effect uh, size and also the different factors. So originally we got 2,461 studies, but after the sorting, we used 38 studies for the synthesis. So we look at different types of coding based on international metrics. Some of the coding or approaches we use, we obtain from UNESCO and other studies. For example, when we talk about field of education, we have the arts and humanities. We have the social sciences and journalism, the natural sciences, mathematics and statistics, uh, health and welfare. We have the business administration and law. So we look at all these areas. And we also look at different educational level, like early childhood education, primary education, upper secondary education, bachelor level education, master level education. We also look at doctoral levels and learning settings. We look at formal learning settings, uh, semi-formal uh, uh, learning settings, informal learning settings, 
in multiple settings. So we know about formal learning settings, semi-formal, yeah, and informal, and also multiple settings already. So and because of that, yeah, I, I can go in and different genre of games. We look at action games, adventure games, fighting games, puzzle games, role-playing games, simulation games, sports games, and strategy games. So if you really want uh, the main details, as I've shared the study, you can go uh, in, in, into the details of the study. So the intervention period, we look at studies less than or just played in one week or uh, played for one week, but less than or equal to four weeks, played for uh, greater than four weeks, but less than or equal to six weeks. So we look at different intervention periods. And all of this, uh, we use a coding scheme based on international metrics. And uh, we look at different types of mobile device like smartphone, tablets, pocket computer, personal digital assistance, and game consoles like Nintendo, Xbox, and the PlayStation. So just focusing on the result, we have different uh, results. But uh, as in consensus with past studies, we've observed that gaming in general, educational mobile games in general, they have effect on learning performance. But as I mentioned, there are different factors. We, like as we uh, can see from the screen, we have action games. It had moderate effect on learning performance. So what was the reason? They are all areas of investigation that we have to look at. Adventure games had moderate effect. Puzzle games have a very large effect, while role-playing games had a large effect. Puzzle games, they have visual spatial uh, aspects, you know, some visualization aspects, they are matching aspects, uh, and sometimes they are easy to play and uh, can be played by children, people of different ages or educational levels. So it's not, uh, it's obvious or not so surprising uh, that it has a very large effect compared to uh, other games and role-playing games, uh, especially, uh, we, we will go into, uh, I don't want to jump the gun for uh, some of my results. And we also look at different fields of education, for example, Action games, uh, when played in the arts and humanities, had a moderate effect. But when played in the um, health and welfare, it had large effect. The natural sciences, mathematics, and statistics, uh, action games have a very large effect. Because action games, uh, you also want to compete. It's like you are in a survival mode. You really act, have to act fast. Uh, fast and you really have to have your attention, develop some motor skills and uh, really uh, level up in the games. So if you come to some of these like statistics, like the health aspect, sometimes there is an emergency at the health setting and you really need to act fast. Uh, I'm in the field of education now, but I studied bachelor's in nursing and work as a nurse for a year before shifting to education. So sometimes there is an emergency and you really need to act fast or you are performing surgery. You need these motor skills, these cognitive skills. That's why action games have effect, large effects. And yeah, so if you really want to get into the details of each of this, you can visit the study and you get into the details uh, of it. And also we look at the intervention period. Uh, for example, action games, when played uh, less than or equal to one week, it has a very huge uh, effect. Uh, but when it is played for one week, but less than uh, four weeks or equal to four weeks, it has moderate effect, the same for six weeks. So what are some of the possible reasons? If you look at studies, there are varying results, there are variation in the results. So uh, we need to really like for... Uh, maybe in your setting, if you want to implement um, a specific type of game, you are looking at all these factors. You it has to be contextual in nature because there are varying results, variation uh, in the results. For example, action games can be very addictive. So uh, the exposure time, do you play it for a long time or for a shorter time? Or uh, do you play when should uh, how long should students be exposed to a specific type of game when you look at puzzle games for different intervention periods it still had a large a, a huge effect or a large effect because 
Puzzle games, as I've said, they are easy uh, to learn. Uh, if you have to make some puzzle, they are entertaining, easy to learn, uh, and uh, it also improves your cognition and you, you have to match things. So it could it can be played by, played by children because the gaming rules are easy to understand. So it can be played by children, adults. I remember I played a lot of puzzle games as a child during my adolescence. And now even uh, as I'm growing, uh, when you get to like webinars like this or different uh, workshops, sometimes you have to play some kind of a puzzle uh like an icebreaker so it's played everywhere so how are adventure adventure games have a negligible effect or small uh, effect in, in terms of the intervention period so all of these are areas we have to investigate so we went in to discuss uh, our study so in general educational mobile games have large effect it means that we should try as much as possible when it is appropriate to implement uh, educational games in education specifically because now mobile phones are in a way easily accessible or ubiquitous in nature we have to implement mobile games in education but of course you have to also focus on the geographic area because of the digital divide or the ai divide so is it appropriate for your specific area or for students. You have to consider the socioeconomic levels yeah, because UNESCO, they are talking about inclusivity, uh, inclusion in education. So how do we ensure equity and quality uh, and equality in education? And different game genres, as I've mentioned, we have the puzzle games, action games, simulation games, fighting games. They all have different effects. Uh, based on different factors like educational fields and uh, the device that is played on. So there are areas we have to really look at when, I don't know if there are game designers here or people, you all have to look at this when you are specifically designing a game for a, uh, some group of students and different genre of educational games might work differently for students. So there are all areas uh, we have to look at and of course puzzle games when we look at different learning settings because puzzle games because of its nature it can be used in the formal educational setting informal setting or multiple settings it can be used so uh, it, it seems it is the one that is applicable or appropriate for different learning settings but uh, you don't just take uh, res uh, research results and implement something in your educational institution you have to make sure it is contextual and we look at the different intervention periods and the uh, mobile device type so all that factors that um, aside the theoretical investigation practically we have to look at its implement uh, implication in education so in conclusion when we employ mobile devices uh, in education uh, probably uh, in different learning settings, it can promote uh, quality education or enhance learning performance. At the same time, the factors that I've talked about, we really have to uh, consider them. Some educational mobile games by be effective for some specific fields or levels of education. So we have to know the particular field, the particular genre, the intervention period, the learning setting. Uh, where a game is applicable. So I would like to end here. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Please put it in the Q&A or unmute yourself and ask some questions. Thank you so much. All right, if there's no questions, we're going to take a quick comfort break. Um, we'll resume at 11 o'clock for Dr. Herman Mayberg. So thank you so much. Enjoy a quick comfort break, and then we'll come back at 10 o'clock sharp. Oh, 11 o'clock sharp. Thank you.
Welcome back after the short break. I hope you enjoyed the first few sessions of this seminar. Welcome, Dr. Myberg. Um, we're excited to hear your two presentations. And after Dr. Myberg's presentations, we're going to have a short break. And then we will resume at 12 o'clock, where Dr. Willem Oliver will be the chair. Thank you so much, Harman. Thanks, thanks, Vikas, and thank you very much for having me and, and for being part of this exciting symposium slash workshop that we are hosting here from the University of Johannesburg together with our collaborators at the uh, University of South Africa. So my name is Herman Myberg. I head the Metaverse Research Unit at the UJ. And our goal is to bring in um, new new technologies into into the university system. So we we do a lot of work on virtual and augmented reality. That's that's what what I enjoy doing most. Um, but we we also experimenting with other formats and other uh, types of games that we are incorporating into into our teaching load. And today I'd like to discuss a little bit uh, about artificially intelligent non-player characters for educational games. Now, I'm a bit of an introvert, so, so I've asked a few collaborators to to join me on uh, this presentation. So this will be together with Sarah, Steve, and Albert. Um, but before we get to to my my collaborators on on this particular topic, um, I'd just like to go over one definition. That's the definition of a non-player character. Now, a non-player character is defined by Wikipedia, which is often the most cited source by undergraduate students, as any character in a game that is not controlled by a player. So. Whenever you think of of um, uh, multi-person shooter games where where you need to go out and and kill your enemies, the enemies are most often these non-player characters. Now, by 2018, we saw that there wasn't a lot of research being done on the impact of non-player characters in in educational games. So by by end of 2018, uh, from this review paper, only 18 good quality papers actually uh, were included into the systematic review that they they conducted, and they found that non-player characters are, are not often discussed in in the design of games. And I think that's something that we we need to start thinking about: is how do we get our games to be more engaging to our audience that's becoming younger and younger. So by 2018, we, we saw only a little bit written about this. 
Um, but then they, there's been an increase in the number of, of uh, researchers focusing on enhancing the capabilities of non-player characters. Last year, this paper uh, saw the day of light. And what, what was interesting about this particular research um, study is they used real people to act out the non-player characters. So you could interact with non-player characters, but it was uh, it, it was designed and it, it was um, run by a real person. So they had to get a lot of students in to play these non-player characters. And that becomes a very tedious process because you need to pay these these characters to form part of your game you need to, to get them um their, their time schedules aligned and you need to get everyone um into the same room with a script that they can read through and that they they can interact with your player with so so it's al although this enhances the non-player character it it does have a lot of drawbacks now Artificial intelligence, or as I would like to refer to it, um, augmented intelligence, is coming into our daily lives more often um, than, than not. So I found this meme, which quite, quite nicely explains how AI has become so ingrained in our daily lives that it's even become a marketing tool in a small Indian uh, tea shop. But AI is coming to games as well, and we, we should be cognizant of the fact that there's new tools that's being developed for us as game designers, and especially for us as uh, educational game designers. Now, one of the most anticipated games that's coming out next year is called G uh, Grand Theft Auto 6. Now, this game is unparalleled in its size, um, and its level of immersion. So I've, I've got a, a brief trailer of it. I do have to um, just acknowledge the fact that it, there, there should be, uh, or there is a parental guidance on this. So, so any young children watching this, rather virtual eyes. But Grand Theft Auto allows you to play in a massive open world and what what is being done now in this new version is they are incorporating artificial intelligence into various aspects of the game so from the characters that you'll see um, in this game you can interact with them you can talk with them and they'll talk back to you um, as as you go through the game it updates automatically and it creates a new world, uh, it, it generates new interiors for, for some buildings so that each time you play the game, it becomes more and more immersive. Now, this is a massive undertaking. The game has been under development for, for more than 10 years already, and um, we are expecting it to launch next year, but um, we'll we'll see when it gets to to the public um then then we'll see what what it's going to cost because there's a massive computing uh, a massive amount of computing power needed to run such games so we'll probably see that they are going to launch this with a type of a subscription package to offset the the cost involved in generating the ai but being at the university of johannesburg and and trying to incorporate 4ir we started using AI in some of our pedagogical tools as well. So we started creating these AI non-player characters um, for our students to actually interact with and, and uh, get, get to know uh, or learn from them. So together with the Faculty of Law, we've embarked on a big project where we are trying to get our law students to interact with different personality types before they go into the real world and really experience how how vastly different uh, the human being can be in, in terms of personality. And here I'd like to introduce um, um, Sarah, which was my first collaborator. Um, sorry about that. Let me just click the right button. So Sarah is one of the first NPCs that, that we created and um, she's still under development. So you'll see that she's doing a, a few very strange um, behaviors or very strange uh, movements. So the animation still needs to be sorted out. But 
what what the case here is is that Sarah is a gender based violence victim, and I know uh, Dr. Irene said that we we should uh, be very careful when dealing with gender based violence. But what we want our students to ha have the experience on is how do you interact with a a person that has experienced gender based violence. So on the back end, we programmed a few facts into, into this NPC. Uh, we set her behavior, and this was a recorded interaction that, that I had with her. What brings you to my office today? I need help getting a restraining order. Why do you need a restraining order? My ex-husband has been abusing me for years. I finally found the courage to leave, but I know he won't stop. What is your name? My name is Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Well, I'm here to help. Thank you. Do you have any questions for me? Yeah, what are steps to get in a restraining order? And will it protect me? Well, the steps are that we file a urgent court application and then that protects you. If he transgresses that protection order, then he faces jail time or a severe fine. Really, that gives me some hope. Yes, the law is on your side. Thank you for believing me. It is my job and my privilege to help you. Now tell me, has he physically abused you? Yes. Can you tell me a story of how he once physically abused you? Yes, he would hit me, push me, and throw things at me. He was always angry, and nothing I did was ever good enough. How long were you married? We were married for 14 years. And has your divorce been finalized? No, it's still in progress. Have you signed the court documents? Cool documents? No, sorry, I meant court documents. Oh, yes, I have signed some court documents. And has he signed these documents? He signed them, but I'm not sure what they mean. I think you need to bring those court documents to me. Okay. Do you have any finances that you can um, help make yourself secure? I have some savings, but I'm not sure if it's enough. Well, this is a pro bono office, so we'll help you for free. Thank you so much. So, so that that was my interaction with Sarah, this gender-based violence victim, and it, it just goes to show that we we can create different experiences for our students to to interact with with different char characters in a very safe and controlled environment. So on our end, we programmed her to have certain knowledge about certain facts. So for instance, that they are busy getting a divorce and that they've been married for 14 years. But we didn't program the text uh, or, or the speech. Uh, we, we weren't the ones that said, if this, then you need to tell this. Then that's generated completely by the AI, which really makes... Um, uh, our lives a little bit easier on on the development side now we we did sarah and that that's one personality type but we also created steve so steve is her husband 
and he's got a, a completely different personality type. Hello, please tell me your name. Steve. Steve, are you married to Sarah Mitchell? Yeah, I am. Well, Steve, Sarah is um, busy divorcing you. She can try, but she won't succeed. And why is that? Because I'm not going to let her. Well, she's also insisted that you verbally and emotionally abused her. That's not true. She also stated that you physically abused her. Lies. She's got evidence. Doesn't matter. Well, it matters to the court and she's getting a restraining order against you. So henceforth, you are not allowed to contact her anymore. We'll see about that. If you do contact her, you'll be facing jail time. I'm not scared of jail. And we're placing her in protective custody. Good luck with that. Well, Mr. Steve, um, I think this concludes our conversation. Fine. So on the one hand, you, you can teach students how to have compassion for a client that, that um, is dealing or going through something very tough and it's in a safe environment. On the other hand, you can also teach students to be more assertive and, and to experience an aggressive um, uh, an aggressive, uh, aggressive person and then help them to overcome their fear of standing up to, to this type of person. So it's not perfect, um, I have to agree, but it's a good start in my opinion. And, and that's, that's what gets me excited about this technology. Now, um, I, I want to do a bit of a live demonstration and this always gets me nervous doing live demonstrations but in the chat i'd love to um welcome your questions so even though we we had this now as as a learning experience on on dealing with different types of of personalities you can also use it as an interactive teaching aid to teach students about different characters from history or different um, experience, uh, d different um, events that happened in history. So for instance, what we did is we created um, a replica or an AI of Albert Einstein, given it the knowledge of, of um, uh, what Albert Einstein did for a living and um, just some some information that we drew from Wikipedia and different other sources. So I'd like to welcome your questions to Albert Einstein. And whilst you are typing that, I'll just switch over to the live demonstration. So you are welcome to, to ask that in, in the chat. And let me just start Albert over here. So in, in the Q&A, any questions for Albert Einstein? So in, in the interim, I'll start this uh, experience. Hello, what is your name? Hello there. My name is Albert Einstein. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. May I inquire as to the purpose of your inquiry? Hello, sir. Yes, I would like to know about your your early childhood. Ah, my early childhood. Well, I was born on March 14, 1879 in Ulm, Germany. I spent my early years in Munich, where I displayed a keen interest in mathematics and physics from a young age. I was always curious about the workings of the world around me and my passion for understanding the universe only grew as I got older. It was during those early years that the seeds of my future achievements were sown. 
Is there anything specific you would like to know about my childhood? Um, tell me about your mother. My mother, Paul and Cock, was a significant influence on my life. She was a talented musician and had a deep appreciation for the arts. Although she did not have a formal education in science, she fostered my curiosity and encouraged my intellectual pursuits. Her support and belief in me played a crucial role in shaping my scientific journey. I am forever grateful for her guidance and love. How do you think your theory of relativity will change the world? Well, the theory of relativity has already had a profound impact on our understanding of the universe. It challenged the notions of absolute time and space, introducing the concept of space-time and the curvature caused by mass and energy. This theory has revolutionized our understanding of gravity and led to advancements in fields such as astrophysics and cosmology. Please tell us about the nuclear bombs that you allegedly developed. I must clarify that I did not personally develop the nuclear bomb. While I did sign a letter to President Franklin D. Roosevelt in August of 1939 urging the United States to pursue atomic research. It was primarily out of concern that Nazi Germany might develop nuclear weapons first. However, I later became deeply regretful of the destructive potential of atomic weapons and advocated for nuclear disarmament. My contributions to science were focused on advancing knowledge and promoting peaceful applications of scientific discoveries. Could you explain the, uh, the theory of photorelativity to me like I'm five years old? Of course, my young friend. The theory of photorelativity, also known as the photoelectric effect, is an important concept in physics. Imagine you have a bunch of tiny particles of light called photons, and when these photons hit certain materials, they can make something special happen. Just like how a basketball hitting a hoop. Indeed, my dear interlocutor, it is quite intriguing. So it's not not perfect, but uh, we we certainly are getting there, and it's it's quite exciting having conversations with this AI based off the knowledge that that we've given it. Now, as a pedagogical tool, it also empowers us to to see how our students are are thinking. So we are using in-world as our back end. And um, what I can do now is I can go to this interaction and I can go through this whole conversation that a student or anyone has had with this AI and see exactly what it is that they did. So um, yeah, I can see that a person asked, hello, what's your name? And the response of the AI. Um, hello, sir. Yes, I would like to know about your early childhood and its response. Tell me about your mother. How do you think your theory of relativity will change the world? So all the questions that I've asked, I can now see on the back end and I can incorporate that into my, my teaching in, in the near future um, so, so that I can address my students' questions um, and make sure that they've got the right answers. I can also see the response of the AI and make sure that it, it was accurate. As this is a developing technology, we still need to to make sure that it is um, it is indeed uh, accurate. But we we are going to see AI coming into our our pedagogy uh, more often than than not. So Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, recently gave a talk specifically on on the power of uh, AI in education. And I'd like to... And education <laughs> is certainly going to change dramatically. You know, I, I think it is forever altered by the course of this technology. But that's happened many times before in the history of education. And every time, uh, people have been quite concerned about what was going to happen. So, uh, you know, we can look at a, a further in history example, like the calculator, or a more recent one, like the search engine. And if you go back and read articles at the time, they sound very similar to some of the debates we are having today. You know, with the calculator, math teacher said, well, if, if students don't need to memorize, uh, you know, times tables or 
like how to how to like calculate a cosine by hand or something like that what's the purpose of mathematical education and how will we ever test if they learn they could be cheating with a calculator so on, on the one hand we've got ai coming in as a potential for cheating but on the other hand we've got it as a pedagogical tool that we can certainly use to enhance our students' learning. And that, that, that's that's where I get excited. So we need to start rethinking the way that we incorporate technology into our daily lives. Now, the importance of NPC in, in games, um, there, there's a lot of different uh, important aspects to it. Um, so it creates a realistic and adaptive behavior for your characters that enhances um, your students decision making um, as they can uh, they they can interact with these characters it enhances the storytelling as well as the immersion of of games so students might be playing these games longer because they get a new experience every time that they play it it can add challenges and and make for more dynamic gameplay enhancing the gameplay ultimately leads to more students uh, to students playing the game more because they want to try and overcome the the shortcomings by by replaying games it can also be highly personalized and adaptive so if you've got a slow slower learner um, i don't know if that's an accurate term but if if you are struggling with a specific concept you can ask the AI to explain it to you over and over again, each time getting a, a new answer and so in doing so, building up a, a new understanding of this particular topic. It's very useful then in, in, in simulation and in training because it gives your, your students this opportunity to really interact with different personality types. Um, even though it's not a 100% real world um, uh, 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 adaptation. It does give them certain aspects of of real world encounters, and it allows for a lot of explore uh, exploration and discovery. And inquiry based learning is such a powerful tool in our our tool set that we need to incorporate this a little bit more. Now, um, the, there's also a reduced uh, cost involved in. Um, developing uh, with AI NPCs, even though um, on the other hand, there might be an increased cost. So why I'm saying these two uh, counter uh, intuitive things is on the one hand side, it's, it's fairly cheap to just incorporate an AI NPC into your games um, if you don't have a lot of control over it. The more control you want to uh, have over this, this NPC, the more costly it's going to become for, for you. So it's, uh, it's a way... Uh, uh, balancing game that we need to uh, make sure that we give good quality education whilst not um, depleting our bank accounts. Now, there are technical limitations as well to these NPCs. As you might have seen when, when I was speaking with my very Afrikaans English accent, um, there, there's often words that it misinterprets. Mis, uh, and that, that can have a challenge uh, for, for your, your AI tool to understand what it is that you mean um, when, when you're speaking to them. For example, the, um, when, when I spoke to Sarah, I mentioned uh, the court documents and, and she heard it as cool documents. So you can just rectify that by having a conversation and saying, look, I, it was a mistake that I made or you, you misheard me. This is the, what, what I mean. It does lack human touch. So even though um, it's, it's somewhat human-like, um, it's not 100% perfect, but I think as we progress in, in these technologies, we're going to see it become more and more human-like. Um, if you think back to to something like ChatGPT, when we first got it, and what, what you can do with it now, it's it's really been enhanced, and it's it's much more human-like. So, so we might be seeing that these NPCs are really um, being enhanced in in the near future. They they exist a, a big um, risk for bias and fairness issues to be incorporated into this. So, especially for us as African researchers, as African educators, we we need to be cognizant of the fact that most AIs are trained on Western uh, data sets. 
and that thing generates a a potential for for these AIs to be racially biased. So it's something that we need to to think about, and we we really need to to make sure that we address this. And the only way that I see that we we can make sure that we address these biases is if we actively engage with the technologies, how to develop it, and make sure that the African story is told as well. There's pri privacy and security issues. Um, so for instance, I showed you the back end of the service that we are using. Um, that data is hosted by a third party. So we don't have 100% um, access to, to that data. We, we don't uh, control where the data is stored. So that, that's something that you need to make sure your students knows and, and that uh, the, the interactions with these AI can be used in future um, to train other AIs, but also that they, they are no longer uh, the owners of, of that data. And it can also generate an over-reliance on technology. So especially in the African context, we, we need to be cognizant of the fact that we we are dealing with internet interruptions as we saw this, we, uh, this past week with the, the um, breakage in internet lines that, that really caused a, a big issue for especially Microsoft Office. So if your AI tools are based on Azure, that might lead to an, an interruption of services. So, so one needs to be cognizant of that. And then there's ethical considerations. And I see that anonymous attendee had a question. Have you identified any unintended arms for students using AI generated characters? And that's certainly an, an issue. If you don't have control over exactly what the what, what the AI is saying to the student, um, it, it could be that there, there is a risk uh, for, for your students and that risk needs to be discussed with the students prior to engaging with these AI tools. Um, like I said, it's not a perfect tool yet, so, so we still need to work on hashing out the issues and seeing where, where we can go. But I have to admit that um, these AIs have, have been censored that, that we are using. So whenever you ask it to, to help guide you make a bomb, um, it will uh, t tell you that it cannot respond to that. Uh, with the gender-based violence uh, victims, for instance, um, it gets very uh, sensitive to, to any questions relating to, to sexual uh, har harassment. And it would often say that I, I cannot respond to that question. So there are safeguards built into these services, um, but we we won't know exactly what risks we are running until we've fully explored it. So that that's the ethical considerations. And then there might be a resistance to the adoption, and that that can uh, be be. Um, compared to when we got calculators, how there was a resistance to adoption, but ultimately we saw the power of the calculator and how it could enhance our mathematical abilities. And that's that's where I fully and firmly um, stand with my viewpoint that we shouldn't be talking about artificial intelligence, but that it should be augmented intelligence. It augments our own intelligence. It enhances our ability to perform work and it, in, uh, it allows us to do so certain menial tasks quicker. So instead of us um, having a mood court where we play the characters of, of um the different characters, we can have an AI that just teaches our students how to go through that process. And then before they, they get to graduation, we can have one or two sessions with real people where they can then experience um, a, a real life scenario. So with that, um, that concludes my, my first talk. I'd like to welcome any questions from, from the audience. Um, so if you've got a question, you're welcome to raise your hand. And um, we, we truly in, enjoy engaging with you. I don't see any hands raised. I don't see any questions at present. Um, 
So that then brings me to the next exciting part, and that's the launch of our new journal called JEXT, the Journal of Exotechnology and Education. It's hosted by UJ Press um, in collaboration with our partners at UNISA. And we we are truly excited about this journal because we, uh, we to, together with the editorial board, we've had uh, various discussions on how we can bring in new innovative publishing techniques into our serious games and higher education. And so it's with great pride that we, we'd like to introduce Jext. Now Jext is an open access, double blind, peer reviewed, multidisciplinary academic journal. Um, it is, uh, we, we set out to, to really be a journal that encompasses a lot of different aspects of both technology and education into one, one um, publication. It focuses on the implementation and use of cutting edge technology and innovative um, uh, in, in an innovation in higher education. And then it's also the official journal now for the symposia that we uh, host annually. So the symposium on, on serious games, um, we'll be publishing the papers and, and workshops in this journal. So we welcome any any public any any um, submissions to this journal for include for for peer review and then ultimately inclusion in in our journal. Now, we welcome innovative submissions, both on the technology and the education side. And, and it's important that we address both of these aspects as technology is becoming more and more a tool that we use in our education. We need to be discussing all the different aspects of, of how to, to use technology in, in education. So it's, it's vitally important that, that we write about this. So our mission for this journal is to guide Africa and the global south into an era of new technology focused on higher education. Now we, we say higher in, in brackets because we will also include publications that deals with all the, the various educational um, levels. So, so you can submit your, your papers on K1 to 12 education, on adult learning education, um, but we we have a very heavy focus on the technologies used on uh, in in your pedagogy. We'd like to establish innovative and disruptive elements in in higher education, such as serious games and AI. And we want to guide educators to invent personalized curricula for undergraduates. And by sharing our knowledge and and the knowledge of others in the global south. We, we can truly enhance um, our abilities to educate our next um, our, our next generation through this this innovative way. Um, our vision is to become a leading journal on technology and education in the global South and Africa. But we want to consistently publish high quality um, articles, but we we want to attract articles by uh, a, a whole uh, different uh, or by by every level of of academics. So from novices to established scholars and international scholars. We, we want to welcome anyone to publish in our journal um, and make sure that even though you're a novice, your, your work gets um, the recognition that it needs and we'll be there every step of the way to ensure that it's a good quality publication. And then our, our goal is to reach ISI status uh, but within the next 10 years. It's, it's quite a, a, a very, very yeah. high goal that uh, we, we've set for ourselves. But I believe that with the support from our editorial board, as well as uh, authors from across the global South and especially from Africa, we'll, we'll be able to achieve this, this goal. Now, what makes Jext a truly innovative journal is that we will be welcoming um, various file formats and submissions. So first of all, we will be publishing academic articles at seven to 10,000 words um, in length, as well as book reviews, that's a, a thousand to 3,000 words. So we will be publishing the standard um, article formats 
in, in our journal. But then we also want to include other multimedia elements, such as videos, podcasts, apps, animations, games, stories, HTML pages, PowerPoints, um, you name it. If it's a digital file, we would love to see if we can't publish it in, in our journal and give authors of different formats the ability to actually get an academic output um, on on their artifacts that they've created. Now, this this is quite an innovative approach, um, I, I believe, and you know, the University of Johannesburg Press has been an instrumental in allowing us to to be able to publish all these different formats. So, once you've submitted your your um, application, for instance, we'll assign a, D, a DOI number to it. And that can then be linked to your profile on Orkid, a Google Scholar, etc. So we're we're looking forward to really publishing a lot of different formats, and that that's that's quite exciting because for us as game developers, um, it's it's often very difficult getting your uh, game published in a way that actually em empowers you as an academic as well. So we'll provide guidelines um, on the formatting, referencing, and submission process that will be available on the Czech's website, which is hosted on UJ Press. And submissions will be through UJ Press. It will then go through a double-blind peer review process to ensure that the quality is good. And um, we'll also make sure that your, your work gets the necessary um, promotion that it needs. Now, this journal um, consists of an editorial board, uh, which was elected. Um, we've got an editor-in-chief, so I've taken up that position. We've got sub-editors, section editors, and members of, of this editorial board, and we are looking forward to welcoming more people onto our editorial board in the near future. Now, the University of Johannesburg Library has sponsored the, the journal for, for the next three years. Uh, ultimately, we want to get to a position where we are self-sustaining. So we do charge an article processing fee of 400 rands per page. Um, that's roughly the equivalent of $20 uh, US dollars per page. And um, But that we'll only start implementing after the first three years. So if you want to publish in our journal, uh, we are currently giving away publication spots for free. Um, it has to go through the peer review process uh, to ensure the quality of the publication. But we want to to welcome your your uh, papers and your submissions to to this particular um, journal. And like I said, we've got close ties with the University of Johannesburg, UNISA, and UJ Press, who's been instrumental in developing um, this this journal. Um, together with my colleagues that's in attendance, Willem, Erna, Irene, um, Prof. Maria, um, sorry, I'm terrible with uh, with uh, pronouns, uh, Vickers, um, we, we've really embarked on, on this journal and it's it's been an exciting journey and we, we look forward to welcoming your submissions in the very near future and ensuring that you get um, the the, uh, the the claim that, that you require from your publications. Is there any questions on um, the Jex journal and um, any any comments on on this new development? So I don't see any questions. We'll share the link to all um, all attendees of the symposium, uh, the link to our JX journal, and we'll also include you in any any marketing that that we'll send out. So once our first edition is published, which we are aiming for June, um, we'll certainly send you an invite um, as as well as a digital copy of of the journal. And with that, I thank you very much for your time. You are welcome to reach out to me. My email address will be shared on our contact sheet at the end. 
and um, I, I look forward to to engaging with you and and like uh, Dr. Irene said, we welcome any collaborations and and hope for a good future u- utilizing these new technologies coming for our or coming into education. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Mayberg. <laughs> we really appreciated and enjoyed your sessions, and we look forward to the journal. Um, I think it's going to be a wonderful journal, accommodating a lot of formats and a lot of exciting um, content. We will now have a break and we will come back at 12 o'clock where Dr. Oliver will take us through the rest of the program. Thank you so much.
and good afternoon to everyone. I hope that you have that you had a good break. I first just want to say thanks a lot for Mr. Vickers von Sale, the chair for this morning. Um, Vickers and I are standing in for Prof. Maria and Prof. Arna. So Vickers, you did a tremendous job. Thanks a lot for that. Thanks a lot to all the presenters who presented. Wow. If you hear everything that they say, you can't believe that it's happening all over the world. And I really do wish that uh, we will have that in South Africa as well. Well, it looks as if at some places like UJ, we already have stuff like that. Um, for the afternoon, we have a workshop. And the first hour of the workshop is allocated to Dr. Irene Lebe. That's going to tell us about storyboarding success, crafting cap <coughs> captivating learning adventures with Twine. She has already sent you the link, so you can click on the link and go into that. After her, from 20 past 1 to 20 past 2, will be Mrs. Elna van Niekerk, who asks, can online synchronous practical sessions replace face-to-face? -face? A case of environmental law legal enforcement. And then we'll have a paper presented by Ravia Banji. Ravi, I hope I am pronouncing your name correctly. <clears throat> it could be Rabia, but I think it's Ravia, I don't know. The development of AI tools for inquiry-based learning of metabolism in a university biochemistry module. And that is that. We will close with that. So, Dr. Rin, if you are there, please. Go ahead and tell us about storyboarding. Thank you very, very much. And um, I am going to give ourselves a two minute break because I cannot share the things I want to share with you in the chat. So I am just quickly going to send it to someone else who can upload it and help you to get the um, documents. So if some of you had to um, have miss your coffee, you are quickly want to run and grab that cup of coffee, run for it. Um, and I will just be a minute and then I will continue. Apologies for the inconvenience, but I do want to share the resource with you. Okay, and I think we are back. I think I'm back. It seems as if I've managed to send it. So hopefully we have a work around that. And, and the reason why I'm sending files to, to Armand to hope that he will be able to share it with you is um, the PowerPoint I'm going to use now is really, really a basic PowerPoint, but it has some little bit of code in that you might find useful as well as to demo twine links that we will play with maybe in the workshop so don't despair and um, we will share it with you and if we can't share it with you then we will just work around it and that's a nice part of being educators so we work with what we have if the technology doesn't play along and if it plays along that is that's nice and that is great so um maybe before i start and this is a very 
huge, nice title for my workshop. But in essence, what it is going to be is that this is going to be a really a basic basic demo of how to use twine and i must say after herman's presentation i was um very tempted to send him a message and say okay don't you want to do this workshop because i think your stuff is really really more interesting and much more engaging um but i also realized that sometimes especially those of us who are very novice in this maybe might need something very much more basic that we can at least um, have a success with without struggling too much and without external help. And hopefully maybe by, by the next symposium, we can venture into the more advanced things. But for now, today, in this hour, we are going to look at twine. So I will not be offended if you are any of you in the audience that feels that um, they've seen some of the things that twine can do they listened to my presentation they saw what maria shared with her you what uh, she did with twine with her students and i'll share the link in the chat with um, for the phd students for their um, novels so if you feel this was enough you know by all means if you want to go and grab a proper lunch that is fine and come back then after an hour for the next session if not then I'm going to say thank you for those who are staying. And maybe before I do the screen sharing and showing you what I want to show you, can I quickly maybe ask by a show of hands? Um, and I don't know if you can raise your hand, so I will not take this as a question, but who of you have used twine before? And this one hand. Um, I don't see, there's a few hands. Um, okay, it seems as if some of you have used it before. Okay. And more. Right. All right, so perfect. Thank you. So some of you have used it. It seems as if not everyone has used it before. So hopefully there will be something new for most of you in this session. So let me go to that side. And I assume, I assume that you can see my screen there. Give a shout if you can't see the screen. Um, so as I said, Apart from the very long title, this is actually going to be a basic demo. And um, we will share with you some of the documents. But for those of you who quickly want to follow along as I am going through this presentation now, if you don't have access to the Google Docs yet, you can quickly scan that QR code or click type in the link. And this is now just what I did quickly during lunchtime, just to, have to get a backup for one of the documents, not all four, only one of the documents. So if you scan the QR code, you will get um you will it will open up the repository of apps that I have just collated. And just under my name, there's one that says a handout for the workshop. So Please see if you can click on that document and then at least download that one. And then when I'm done with um, the quick po the PowerPoint and we go into the activities, hopefully by then you might have access to the Twine folders or files as well. If not, we just continue. So can I move on or do you quickly need a minute or two more to type it in? I am going to assume that everyone could access the link. Okay. All right. So I've spoken quite a lot about um, Twine this morning and Maria did as well. So maybe just to quickly recap what we've said about Twine is that Twine helps you to make playable branching scenarios. And the idea is that it will not be linear. So it will not be that everyone do A, B, C, D and that 
exact order. And depending on how you create it, they might end up at D and some might end up at G wherever the scenario takes them. But then Twine is really geared for interactive stories with clickable options. And with the newest updates and the last few months in Twine, they have actually now um, options where you can fill in the blank and you can embed other files in it, like Maria did with her challenges that she had in her game. Now, as I've said um, before in the morning session, you really do not need to know coding if you work with Twine. It helps. It definitely helps a little bit if you want to do some um, different things. But if you just want to do the basic things, you really do not need to know coding and programming. And there are a bunch of YouTube videos that actually explain everything of how to do Twine, how to add the images and how to add the audio and the different interactivities um, as well. So for today, we might add some images. We'll see if we get time for that. We are not going to um, add audio and those things. We're going to create a basic um, scenario and we might add one or two images and that would most probably be all that we have time for. Now, um, as I've said also this morning, and sorry for repeating that, um, but yes, sometimes it doesn't um, meet all the accessibility criteria for screen readers and for a student that is different able. So you need to check. And if you add an image, you can uh, um, add an alt text to that image as well. Just then make sure that the image isn't of such a nature that the student cannot progress if they cannot use the alt image. And again, depending on your audience, you know who are, who are your students. If you know that there are students that is going to struggle with your challenges because it's PDFs or it's, it's um, images, then either do something different or give them a different option or maybe then look at a different platform as well that allows for that. Now Twine, and I've put the link um, in the chat just before lunch. So Twine, and you, if you type in twinery.org, then you will come to this page that you will see on the screen. And there are two options. So you can download the desktop app and then you take it to GitHub as well where you register or you can use it in the browser. So if your institution do not allow you currently to download things on your computer, you need administrative um, permission and they do all the things and ask them many, many questions, then you can play for today in the browser option. The only problem is if you only play in the browser option, if you clear your history, you clear your cookies and um, you use a different computer, then you most probably will not have access to your guides that you've created. So I want to seriously encourage you, not, not necessarily now during the um, workshop, but afterwards that you download this desktop app if you want to play with Twine. So if you create an eye, I'm going to quickly show you what we are going to do. So, and then we are going to go back and then we will do it together. So I will, when I'm done with the demonstration, I'm going to open the Twine um, app or the platform. And as I do it, you can do it on your computer as well. So hopefully that will guide you a little bit in the process. But when you open Twine and you start with a new project, you will see that there is a button where you, well, I'll, I'll come back to the button, sorry. This is the stories and this is now some of the stories that I've created or uploaded. If you open one of them, you will see there's a lot of the background planning behind that. And when you play it, it actually looks like this. So there's quite a, different, a few different views on this. I've shared this morning with you this novel, so I'm not going to talk about it again, but um, you have now the links in the handout, so you, you please feel free to go and visit them and have a look at those um, interactive novels that the PhD students created. Now, if we then look at Twine, there are different story formats. And this is important 
because you can save yourself a lot of frustration by making sure which format you are using. So last night I came to the point of really, really being frustrated until I realized that I'm working with SugarCube and all the videos I'm watching is on Arlo. And that is why the links do not appear, the, the coding isn't there, and it is just one huge frustration. You use the nice words, a huge frustration. So make sure what do you want to achieve. So if you want like a Flora's game with a banner at the side where you can save the game and come back and you um, can you can save and come back and save the things that you've collected, then SugarCube is a nice option. But for today, we are going to look at Harlow and um, in that format. So I've also added some games or um, examples. These are not my examples at the bottom of the um, page, but uh, um, maybe for you to open to see how it works or what is the possibilities that, um, that you can create with Twi. So if we then, and as I said, I will come back to this. I just quickly want to talk you through this. If you open Twi and then, if you've created storage before, you will see it otherwise. You click at story, you click at the new button because you are now going to create an entire new novel, a new story or a new interactivity for your students. When you click on it, it will open this um, dialog box for you and say, okay, what do you want to do? So you're creating now a new story and what do you want to call it? So in my case, I called a demo for Twine 2024 so that I can find it easily and I've created it. Then it opened this for you. And by default, it will open the first block for you. There, and I, I hope you can see my cursor as well. Uh, let me just quickly get a cursor. Uh, sorry. Also, so it opened this def default block for you. And this is also your start place in your game. You can change it later on. So if you do not want this to be the start anymore. You can move it somewhere else. The little green airplane, whatever that is. Now nah, you can move it. So you double click on that one. And again, it opens a dialogue box for you. And what is nice in Twine as well is it gives you hints. If you look there, that it says double click here and you can edit this. So double click and it opens this one. And then you rename it. And I keep on forgetting to do that. So click on the rename and say what you want to call it. Now you will see, I will show you a little bit later. I've got my game and then I've got my style sheet as well. And in my style sheet, I tell the uh, program what, um, how my story should look. Now, should it be a gray background with black typing on it? Or should, uh, should it be a um, black typing in a white box? And should my links be blue, my hyperlinks that take me to the next block? Or do I want them to change color when I hover over it so that the student can be sure that this is not just one long answer, but that there they are two different answers just to prevent any confusion there. So we can create a style a sheet later on as well, but um, then we continue there with our game. Let me just take the cursor away. So we click new passage and it opens the block for us. We've already named that one now. So now we double click on our passage. So now we've opened it up and now we can start to draft our story. And this is really easier than it sounds. So we double click and we start to type our story. So this was a dark and dusty night or whatever you want to say. And then you want your participant and your reader to go somewhere. And that is where you give them the links in the brackets. Now, maybe before I continue any further, a, a warning that um, Twine do not do does. They don't have a spell check. So you need to spell check your um, writings, your paragraphs yourself. And it is quite frustrating if you have done everything, you go back and you create a PowerPoint slide and you realize, 
oh my goodness, I made a spelling mistake. But it, at least and most of the things are easily changeable. You can go and easily adapt it, but just know that there are no spell checks. So that was kind of a frustration to me. And maybe that's part of planning as well, that you plan your scenarios on a Word document and copy and paste from there. So you start to write it, and then you give your options, your links to where it should go. Now your links are then between two double brackets. It's like, it, this is the link, choose this. And you will see the moment that you type it and you put in the second bracket, it automatically open that passage for you and it links it to you. So it's un unlike in Miro where you have to create a new page and then you have to draw the link or in if you do this in PowerPoint or in another platform where you have to physically create the links, the moment that you close your brackets, it makes the link. Now you will see it didn't create the second one for me because I did not add the second bracket there. And the moment I add it, it will make the second link for me as well. So this is very nice and easy to see how your story is then branching. So now I have my beginning and now I have my two branches and now I want to see, but what does it look like? So I go to build because I'm building my story, but I quickly want to play. There's, a, there's another button where you can text from different places, but for, especially now in the beginning, we go to build and play. And if you click the play button, it shows you what your story looks like. So my sheet that I've created was that I will have a black background with white writing and my links, URL links will be blue. And that is actually the default setting as well. So if you don't want to create a style sheet, you are covered there already. Okay. So now you can see my two links there. Now I want to add the color with that. When, when I said earlier that if they hover over a link or something, that's a different color. And this is where the style sheet then comes in. So I create the new passage, which I told you. And I call it style. And here is the text that you can put in if you want the, the, um, the links to be a different color. You can copy and paste it from my document that I've shared with you. And give a shout if you couldn't find it. I just quickly want to check here in the chat. Um, it, it has been shared, ah, Dr. Ari. Thank you so much. Perfect. Okay. So you can just copy this URL and put it in your style sheet. So what does it ask? It says you want to enchant, so you want to make it nice now. And it asks, so what do you want to make nice? But, so you want to make the link nice. But, and what do you want to do there? You want to make the text color navy, but you also, when you hover over it, so when the cursor is over it, you want to change the text color to green. And then the, the trick here is you need to count how many end of brackets they need to be. It's like in maths, you know, add this and add this and then add the, the entire calculation. So you have to count and say this one, two, three, four brackets there. So, sorry, let me count again. So there's one and it's closed, another one. So all those brackets add up to make one activity. And you will see the moment that you added the correct number of brackets there, it will actually show you this is an active link now. So this is, um, I think they call it macros. As I said, I'm not into programming. So what I could gather is it's a macro or something. So the macro is active and it will work. Now, um, you can also, now that you've created your style sheet, you can tag it. You can um, give it colors, and you'll see in one of my games, I gave tags to my correct answers. My correct answers, I made green. The 
average answer is yellow and the bad answer is red. So for your style sheet, you can tag it, you can make it a red, so a red color, for instance, that you know that all your sheets that's not linked to your game is a different color as well. This is not crucial, but it, um, it shows in most of the videos, they show you how to do this. And there is my entire style for my game. So if you, um, I'm just first gonna take that away. So we've talked about the page. So if you open the book, the novel, how would it look? So our page will be gray and our text color will be black. Then there's another one. So when there's then a passage on the page, I still want the um, text um, black, but I want a white background. So I don't want the gray background, background anymore. And that is for accessibility purposes. So I want a clear background that is a good contrast between the text and the background. But I want my background for the rest of the novel, for the page, a different color. But where they need to read, it needs to be a sharp contrast. And then, and this is the other interesting little piece here, is this, and this is a bit of programming that I beg, steal, and borrow from, um, an, from another video, video tutorial. And this is actually just to make sure that when you look at your text the, uh, in your passage, sometimes it is very close to the border. And I like to have it just a little bit away from the border. So it's not as if it um, merges into the border. And here you can put some padding in, um, like in winter months when we pad ourselves a little bit. So here you put in a little bit of padding for your um, text so that it's not merged into your border there. And then, as we've said, there's the color of the um, hyperlinks that we have created. Then we are going to move into images, if we have time to play with images today. And this is how we add an image. Now, first of all, it's, it, the, um, in sugar cube and things, it's, it's easier if you have a folder and you have your um, images and your audio in the folder and you move the entire folder. In Harlow, I found it's easier if you use images from Pixabay or from an online repository. It can be your own online repository, but um, it just makes it easier to share. So if you look at the way you add your images, it starts again where our um, multiple choices that we had is in square brackets. This one is in a little um, bigger as and smaller as, um, smaller as and bigger as, but anyway, these little icons and everything happens between these two semi-triangle little thingies. And I, for, for the life of me, I cannot remember the name of it. But now we give the instruction to Twine of what we are, what we want to do there. And um, first of all, ING, not ONG, ING because it's an image, not the, the abbreviation for image. And this is a source file. So it's a, uh, the SRC there is for source, and you're obviously going to type everything in black now. So beginning of the bracket, ING for image, source file. And then it, you could give the equal sign. So where must they find? Where must the program find this image that you find? So where is the source? And there you put in the URL. And I'll show you now how I've, I've done that. And then you can actually close the, bra the bracket there or the instruction if you want to. I usually put in the width as well because very often the images are too big or too small and I want to make it bigger or um, um, smaller. And then it's just easy if I already have the width in, then I can make it 100 or 20% if I like to. Then I don't have to go back and go and fix it. So if we look at the code there that we've written, it's the image, the source, the address with the extension, I'll show you now, and then the size, which is then optional. You can decide whether you want to do it or not within the 
little okiki quickies. So, if I can give you an example then of how it would look if you add it in your twine passage, there you will see, there it is. We started with our little bracket, the image, the source, equals, and then in inverted commas, do not forget the inverted commas. I've learned that last night as well, after lots and lots of frustration, the inverted commas. And then you put the entire URL in there, as well as the extension. Is that a PGA, a PNG, PNG, a, J, a JPG, whatever type of file this is. And then obviously, if it is wide, the width that you want to have there. And from there on, you can just go on and continue building your branches. So, if I can recap before we start to play with this. You open the website, or you, and you can download it, or otherwise you play online. You click on story. You're going to create a new story. You're going to double click in that block and you're going to rename it. Then in that block, after you've renamed it, you're going to start typing your, your scenario or your story of your novel. After you've typed the beginning in that block, you're going to add your choices. So where must the person go to? What must he do? Must he choose to go to school or to the mall? What do they want to do? And then you test it by clicking bolt and the play button underneath that. If you want to add another a building block, you can double click the past passage and then you can start adding your image there if you want to just practice it separately before you add it in your game. What this might look like is We've opened it, we started a new story, we renamed it, and in this case, we're gonna say, make healthy choices. I start with my scenario and said, I decide I'm gonna eat healthy because my cholesterol is high, and whatever the scenario is. And then I said, okay, it is now half past 11 at night, I am hungry, I need to make good choices, so what will I drink? Will I drink a smoothie? Or will I drink energy drink? And I didn't put in water there. Water would have been a better choice. But what would be my choices? Again, the, because it's choices in double brackets there. Then I taste it and I see if it is working. Any questions up to the up to here? I hope you are still here. Okay. Um, now I am going to go over and show you how I played this or how I created this. And then I will let us do it together. So let me quickly escape here. And close this. This is usually during a live demonstration when you have to do the same easier if you have two screens. Um, I have a second screen here, so I'm going to play on this screen where I show you. So if you feel lost, if you um, want to stop me, please stop me. This is, I think this is maybe the most frustrating thing in a, in a workshop. If the workshop presenter goes click, 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 and you click here, and you click there, and then... I'm lost and then I just leave and I go make some coffee. So give me a shout if you get stuck. I do not mind to stop and go back. Um, Denise, there was a hand. Um, let me just quickly check in the chat. Okay, I 
think we've covered all the questions there. Um, okay. Right. So let me do this again. And I assume you can see my Twine screen with some of my own games, some of my students' games that they have uploaded. Um, but we are now going to create our own new one. So as I said, please give a shout if you are behind. I, I, I really, really don't mind stopping. So I want us all to start at story. Um, and give a shout also if you cannot see my cursor, because that, that might be a problem there. So we're going to start that story, and we are going to create a new story. So click on New, and it will ask us, what do we want to call our sto story? So let us call it um, Eating Healthy, while well, we are now there on that topic. Uh, eating healthy okay so I'm happy I've got the eating healthy um, topic there and this is my first um, passage by default and it will always as I said start here at the little green thing again now I can move this this is the nice part to where I want it. So I usually just actually move it up to the top so that I can work from there. Now we are going to double click this and we will rename this. And usually I say something like start or in the beginning, or if I want the students to register, I write register year. So start, and I say, okay. So now I have my passage, the name of my passage, and I can start writing my scenario. So I want you all, so I will not talk while I type, I want you to rename your passage, and I want you to write something there. Your story, the beginning of your story. So think of what you are teaching, if you are teaching um, in health sciences or engineering or political science, what would be a story, a, an interactive novel that you want your students to, to read? So for a few seconds, I am going to let you type. I'm going to give you just a minute or so to type.
Okay, hopefully you have now something in there that um, that that is the start to your story. Now, now we need to decide what are you going to do. You've, in my case, you've now received the the news that your blood cholesterol, I hope I spelled it correctly, is elevated. So, and you need to change your diet. So now we can decide and say. Let's give them a choice. We start with our double bracket, bracket, bracket. Um, you are upset. And if you look at the screen, the moment I've, I've put the second bracket there, it will create my passage for me. So now I have the by one choice, what I can do, I'm going to, in this case, I'm really upset and I'm rather going to go to another doctor or um, and you know what, I want to quickly change that because we want to write this in the first person. I am upset. Um, so let's change all of this to the first person. Not a very good story, but... And this is one of the things in this scenario is please try to... After my diet, please try to write it in the first person because you want the, the player, the reader, to emerge him or herself in, into this story. Okay, so I'm upset and I changed doctors or um, I hope my spelling is correct, you know, and these are the options. So I have my options, so I can either be upset or I can do something about that. Now we just build it out from there. So, um, that I'm worried. Um, I am not going to keep on typing because I think it's very boring to watch me sit and type. So I just want to show you a few examples here and then I am going to let you do, the, do your own planning for a few minutes. What is important here is that you cannot have the same um, option there. So if I... With the same option there, I quickly want to show you, if I take this one and, oops, and I put it here, let me just open this one, it will link it back to that choice. So that is sometimes also nice if the student answered something and you say, Oh, do you want to reconsider? Do you want to try again? And then if they say yes, you can take them back to that choice as well. So can I give you five minutes to sit and play with this and see if you can bold it out and... Um, then I am going to do the, the thing that all the lecturers do and ask you if one of you want to actually show us how you started your branching scenario. Um, you can put it in the chat that you are willing to share and then we'll ask um, the, the host to make you a panelist so that you can share your screen. So I'm going to give you five minutes.
I'm going to give you about a minute more to finish your branches. I hope there's a, a, quite a few branches already. Okay, is there someone that is willing to share their screen and show us what they have created? Arna, please do. I can actually not see you on okay, the screen. Okay, I can. Um, Dr. Irene, I just want to say um, she doesn't have the option to share a screen at this moment. Oh, dear. Um, is there um, somebody that will be able to help us with that? Um, is there um, someone from UJ? Let me see if I can make her. Maybe I can make her a host. Let us see. Um, okay. Anna, you should be able to, I think. No, Dr. Arvin, she still can't share the screen. Ach, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, that may is... I just, yeah, may I just find out from the other participants, can they, do they have the ability to share the screen? Can they just um, say if they've got the ability, please? Arna, it says that you have declined the invitation. So I'm going to try again. Um, I don't know, Herman, or so, someone from UJ here. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also trying to promote her. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Let's just see. There, there was two Ernas. So I hope uh, I I got the right one. Oh yeah, I'm also here with the client again. Ah. What well, whilst we try and get Arna online, is there perhaps anyone else that wants to to share? I think everyone might have the same. Ah. Oh. I don't know, we see your photo. But we cannot hear you, or I cannot hear you. Okay, Dr. Arin, there's no possibility. It's looking oh. like there's no possibility for her. I am so sorry. And I was really looking forward to seeing it. No worries. Then we we work around that. So it might then be that no one will be able to share, I assume. Okay. So maybe then you are all safe and you do not have to share your screen. So saved by that. And um, then I am going to go to the next um, phase then. So in the chat, I have pasted some code for you and it is in the handout as well but I thought it's easier if I just copy and paste it for you. So now we want to make the style sheet. So I'm once again going to share you know, my screen sadly. Uh, 
here and hopefully you are seeing yeah i think you are seeing the right one so we've seen to make the style sheet we click on new so we're going to make a passage but a new passage so it's not a new story now it's just a new passage so we click on the new passage and then you will see it is unrelated to any of the others so it's a loose standing one double click it and we are going to rename it it's not there because then it just drops down to the bottom we are going to rename it and we are going to rename it style and you will see um, the different formats of different names for some of these sheets and you have to stick to that convention so we have a style there and now we are going to paste, you paste the code that is in the um, chat there so now you can see that your page will be black and you can change that so you can go and th type in purple um, or the text will be purple or the background pg background is gray you can make it white and um, the passage that will come up and i will show you now again what the passage is the passage um, background is white and then the padding the big little bit move away from the um uh the the border is then there's a size for the border there and then we said we want to change the hovering of the docket of, of the cursor so there it is so if we close it now and this is always the stress when you do a live demonstration that you hope it works and you didn't break the code in one or other spectacular way but we are going to start there now so we are going to we said we are building it so we want to play it now and it always starts at the green one and you can move the little green um airplane or thingy but for now we are there so let's play it so there you can see there's your story there are your options and if you hover over your options oh goodness it didn't take the color i will have to fix that but it is supposed to be green and now I see it's light blue so not quite sure how I managed to do that but that is fine we will fix that again so that is then our style sheet and I just want to really see what I did wrong here <gasps> maybe let me just quickly see and that is that's something I forgot to show you the details and if you click on details, it actually tells you what format you are using. But we are using the hard load format. So obviously between copy and paste, I did something very wrong here. <clears throat> uh, I will play with it a little bit again while, while we continue with our practice. Always fun and games. Now I want us quickly, before we wrap this up, I think we are nearly at the end of our workshop. I just quickly want you to add an image in there. So let's see if we can grab the URL for, of the image. I just want to, and with my luck, it again will not work, but let's go in good faith. And I'm going to type that image in the chat as well, although you should have it in your document. So keeping our fingers crossed that this one will work. Otherwise, we will have to find a different image. So let's do it from the, in the start button. So let's add our image there. And we, I seriously hope it works. It seems as if it should work. And let's play it from there. Oh, and there's my image. Okay, small mercies. One thing is working. Okay, so now I have my image in there. I have my 
start of my synopsis. I have my choices, which sadly doesn't change to green, but to light blue when I click on it. And I have my image. If I click on the this option, it will take me to my next um, choice. And that is actually the only, the only place to where I have bought. So sadly, mine, my story ends there. Just close the chat here. I am going to stop there for a moment. Any questions, concerns, apart from my green coat that is now light blue? Erna? Uh, Irene, can you hear me? Yes, I can. That's exciting. Uh, okay, now I'm talking on Bloom's uh, computer. Okay, so I wrote a whole story about I don't want to eat the food because it's not healthy. And uh, one of the options is that I leave the palace and go to a friend's home, uh, but there's nobody there. And as I'm hungry, I have to go back to the palace. So what I want to know from you is how do I link my my story back to this to the beginning? Because if the if this is the scenario, <clears throat> how uh, well well I get back. So the student that start all over, he can be inside the other road that I also made. Uh, to go to the kitchen and ask for food. So I need to make a move. And, and that is very possible. So let me um, share again, and then I can quickly show you how we looped back. So, yes. So um, let's Take this one, and I am now just going to use your example of, um, let's say, I am hungry, and I'm, I'm now just doing something there. Okay, so now there's the hungry one. Now, if I let me just close this one. Now I have the option to, and my story continue, uh, go to friend's house, or you said go to kitchen. Okay, so, so in this story, in the, in the, in the I'm hungry part, you are, say for instance, at home. Ah, so, okay. so you are hungry and you're at home. So you can either go to your friend's house or you can go to your kitchen. When you go to your friend's house, you said, um, nobody there. Oopsie. Sorry. So, nobody there. So, now you can decide. If you want them to go back to the home, you can say, and this is a little trick here. So, you want them to go back to the I'm hungry, which is the house, but you don't want to say that. So, now you can say, go back home, but now you must put in a hidden message there that the, com that the computer can see, but that the participant or the player cannot see. And that is a little dash with a, the thing in machine that looks like an arrow. So if you put in your dash there, so it tells you, if they click on this option, it will take them to. And then you have to exactly type in the heading of that passage. So that passage will be, um, I am hungry. And if I click it, you will see what, hap what is happening now. It takes them back. Then you can see. So now they can go back or they can, for instance, um, 
say, let's see, go to shop. So if we play it from, from there, um, ah, play, unfortunately it will now start there, but we'll see plays from there we was I'm hungry and now you click and you go to your friend's house um, and there's nobody there and can you see there now we can say go back home which is actually the I am hungry passage and they click it and they go back home and they can make another choice and they can go to the kitchen. Does that solve your problem? Yes, thank you, it does. Thank you, oh, Arlene. Perfect. Um, what you also can do, those of you who have received the file, the Twine files. So I have played last night and I've created two demos. Now, the one at the bottom I gave up finally on the coding, so if you progress till there, you'll see why. But you can actually take that two folders. And if we go back to the library, you can actually import those folders. So if you, I'm just, not that. If you click on library and you click import, it will ask you what do you want to import. And then you can say, okay, I want to import a story. Uh, wait, I am not screen sharing. Let me. So share the screen. I keep on forgetting. Uh, okay, there you go. So the, the two stories that I've sent you, if you click on library, so at this stage you were in, um, where's the I am hungry game? Eating healthy. So we were there. Now you decided you've played enough with your own. You want to play with mine and mess that one up a little bit. And you can because it's now yours. It will not influence my game. You can go back and you are now in your library. So if you click on library, it asks you, so what do you want to do? And here you want to import. So you click import. And you choose the folder. And those two that you've downloaded from the Google Drive, you can import one of them. Only one at a time, but you can import both. And as you import it, it will again appear there. And you can work on it. If you just click on the link, it has the little um, round icon. It will take you into the player mode. So then you cannot edit it. So that is how we share it with our students. They, they get that link and they can play with it. But if you want to edit it, you import it into your library and then you play. And you can break the links if you want to. You can change it. This is now your playground to play with. And hopefully in a few months' time or a year's time, we will do another one where you can show us what you have created and how you have added your interactivity. Um, and though I didn't show you how to include the, um, the file that Maria showed, where she used the word lab, I can't remember that one. Um, but I have actually played with it quickly during lunchtime, and it is really in easy to just import that iframe of that activity into your Twine folder as well. So if you struggle, please feel free to ask me. I'm sure Maria will also show you. Um, she's actually the expert on this, I have to say. Um, I shared, I saw Maria's game and I, I sent her a message, uh, but she had submitted this and I said, you need to show me how you do these things. This is, this is amazing. So um, here is definitely a case of the student teaching the, the teacher how to do certain things. And I, 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 her game was really, really amazing. Maybe because it had a wine bar in as well. You know, what can I say? I'm from South Africa. We like good wines. But her game was really, really good. Um, so let me stop here. Okay. I think my time is up. Um, so sorry for that. Um, this was a very, very rushed kind of show and tell how to do. 
But I really hope with the very basic handout that I gave you that you will be able to start your game, that there's some codes in there that you can use. And if you get stuck there, please feel free to import one or, one or both of those games in your library and play with it. Hello, back to you. Thank you. Well, thanks, Dr. Irene. This was really, really good. And I just want to remind the people that um, while it's round about one o'clock here in South Africa, it is round about midnight there where Dr. Irene is now. So, Dr. Irene, we really do appreciate that. And it was so illuminating for us um, to think that you can build stuff like that so easily. And I think that is a big problem that most of the guys have. And that is that it is very difficult to start. And they think to build a game, you really need a designer and you need all those guys, a developer, to do it for you. And here you've shown us that you can do it on your, on your own. You can do it yourself. And um, I really want to thank you for that. There's still a little bit of time. So if there's anyone who wants to ask a question, please ask a question. Okay. And maybe, sorry, if I can quickly say, before we wait for a question, this is also a nice thing to give students as an assignment to create, to say, this is a scenario and these are, what are the possible, possible answers to this, the first question? And then student A, create the scenario for answer one, and student two, create the scenario for answer B. And as they go along, you can combine these stories and you can actually make a very interesting novel or interactive fiction books to choose your own adventure book based on these things. And you can let them collaborate and collate as well and then showcase the best one. Give them a prize for the best one. I was to ask you a question, please. Irene, just a quick one. Uh, does the story save automatically or how can I save my story? It's saved automatically if you work on the desktop. So if you download the app on your computer, it saves. But I'm a little bit um, paranoid. So I usually go and um, if I go to, where's my story? Let me quickly show you before, in the last two minutes. Um, I usually go and when I am done, I say, no, 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 I have to find where. Publish to file. So under bold, publish to file, and it then saves in my, my documents. It creates automatically a file for your twine stories, and it saves there. So that is then also the link, the, the one that I've sent you. It's that link that you can use. But then if you open twine, the app on your desktop, the one with the green and blue arrow, it should bring you back to this screen that you see here with the passages that you can work on. Thanks, Irene, it's working. No, Adna but, says but, it's working. Perfect. Any other questions, um, ladies and gentlemen? Sorry. If you see, want to say something, Dr. Irene, please say. I see Karina's got a hand raised. I don't know if she has access to the mic. I hope so. Unmute. Okay, sorry. Yes, now I could unmute me. I want to know, you've created now the story or this, um, but how do you uh, share it with your students if you want to make it like a gamification in a, um, to, to, um, that they must participate? Uh, complete the the story that you've created with the different options. I hope I'm clear. So if if that I want them to play my game with the different options, I yes. put it in on the LMS. So in Moodle or in I don't, I'm not sure which black um, LMS you use, we just import that into Moodle because it's an HTML file like um, storyline. So you can 
in, in, embed it there and it will play there. Or alternatively, you um, give them the, um, the folder, the one with the little circle in, the one that you've received now, and they can play just from that, um, from that link. So you put it in email or wherever, they open it and they can play it. But I would recommend that you embed it in your LMS. And very often these analytics that you can track, I have mixed feelings about analytics and sometimes if students know their behavior is tracked, they don't necessarily want to see what if. What if I eat the chocolate or what if I go against the convention and I am rude to this person, what will happen? And if they know they are tracked, they don't always want to do that. But I will definitely, I think the safest option is to embed it in your LMS. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Dr. Arie, the we just questions want to you would ask for Maria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. We just want to say thanks a lot for this workshop. Um, this is really something that we're going to take with us together with what Armand told us about um, unity. So um, these things are coming together and we are going to do something with it. Thanks a lot. Thanks um, for having me. That's a big pleasure. Um, our next speaker is Mrs. Elna van Niekerk. She's going to um, enlighten us about can online synchronous practical sessions replace face-to-face? -face? The case, environmental law, legal enforcement. Okay. Elna, it's over to you. Thank you, Willem. Appreciate that. So share screen. Um, I actually am not a Zoom specialist. So do I do one per participant can share at a time? Uh, I have no idea how to share my screen with you. Um, one panelist, host, host only. Okay. Um, it's on the shares. Do you see the share screen? It's in the, the middle green of button. Your, the green button, yeah. I do, and when I click on it, okay. All right. Uh, I'm BC before computers, so you need to remember that. I feel very accomplished that I managed to do this. So let me see. Share sound, optimize share screen. Willem, can you just tell me That's if you it. can see? We can Perfect. see the screen. <laughs> already feel, Thanks a lot. Of, already okay, feel just, accomplished. <laughs> yeah, I just want to find out, does everyone see the screen? Because I see it, but yes. Arna doesn't see it. Yes. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Colleagues, good afternoon. And uh, Willem and Arna and, and Armand, thank you. You've taken me out of my comfort zone to do the show and tell. So this is not really a workshop, it's a show and tell. And I'm asking the question, can we change the synchronous practical, a face-to-face -face, uh, practical to an online practical? And this is what we try to do. And this was pre-COVID. So actually helped us through COVID <laughs> at the end of the day. It was an interesting experience. So let me just give you a little bit of background. The background, um, the government promulgated NEMA, the National Environmental Management Act in 1998, and then expanded it, it several times, 2008, for instance. And, and that act specified that the Minister of Environmental Affairs, okay, so these, the, names, the name of the departments have changed. So I'm, I'm just talking about environmental affairs as if it's not changed. Must appoint inspectors, environmental management inspectors. The, the press started to call these guys the green scorpions. And that is what we dubbed them. Um, we called them the green scorpions. So the environmental management inspectorate was, was um, brought into being then. And so DEA, 
the Department of Environmental Affairs immediately jumped in and started to to develop the training because they that is now what 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 they were supposed to do. And then in 2007, the director called all the universities in the country and said, no, but that's not our mandate. Our mandate is not to teach. Uh, the universities are, are mandated to teach. We want you to teach it. And in 2008, UNISA accepted the invitation and we were contracted for three years to do it. But the Department of Environmental Affairs were very, very prescriptive. So they developed the study materials. Uh, they developed the practical session for, it was a two week practical session, extremely intensive practical session. And so UNISA basically did all the, the admin, but DEA also vetted the students. So some students were not allowed to engage in, were not allowed to register for the short course. Um, so basically we did all the admin, we did the registrations, the admin, the certification, and then the assessments and the practical, we did all the administrative part of it, but we also set most of the assessments on our platform, which was then Sakai. So then the contract ended in 2013. We had some pipeline students in 2016 and DEA after that offered us and said, but you can use the study material. We developed it. It's open source, which was rather a, a surprise for us. But then two hurdles came up. The one was we didn't agree with the NQF level or with all the content that DEA had in their study material. We thought it was completely overloaded and the NQF level was too high. And then in 2018, all the SLPs, the short courses at UNISA, had to move to the Center for Lifelong Learning. And then this became a huge problem because the the, the newly established Center for Lifelong Learning was plagued with severe governance issues and they really couldn't do this. It took them 11 months to just get a contract for the external specialist and that's a year. So you can't offer anything if you wait that long and by then you had to start a, a new uh, contract already. So it was extremely uh, problematic for us and we needed to make some decisions. So the first decision we took is we're going to make new short courses, but we will still do it um, in a fashion that if somebody wants to take these, they can apply to the minister to be designated a green scorpion because only the minister can designate a green scorpion and it's done on experience and training. And we decided to go fully online so the previous one, we had some of the materials online, but it, on the previous learning uh, management system, but we even wanted to do the practicals online now. So we decided to blend some synchronous and asynchronous, but online. We wanted to be decided to blend the my module site, the learning management system, which then changed to Moodle from Sakai to Moodle and MS Teams because once a student registers at UNISA, they have access to all the Microsoft apps. And we wanted to bring in more gamification. We had such a lot of fun when we did the, the practicals face-to-face, -face. really, really had a lot of fun, but we learned a lot. And so we decided we need to keep the fun factor because we love to learn while we play. People, uh, humans, they play because they like it, even animals. And so the two issues that is very important in, in environmental law is inspections and investigations. And there's a difference between the two. And so for the inspections, we decided we're going to use the picture bank of all the pictures we collected, of all the practicals, because we did about 15 by that time, between 2008 and 2014 and just do PowerPoint presentations to, to lead the students through the inspections, but then for the investigations, and this is basically what Adna and Willem asked me to show you is, we decided to use some of the DEA videos, which were extremely good and professional, and we developed some very amateur videos, and it's just academics. So, so I will show you some, I can't show you everything. It will take me an hour just to show the videos. So I'll show you short clips of it, but you will see 
what amateurs can do and hopefully it'll inspire you to to do a little bit um, yourself so this is the learning management system Moodle and we chose the theme the lightning so environmental legal uh, management legal enforcement so we thought by that time the carrot isn't working anymore people are naughty they're not complying with legislation so this is now the whip and we designed online learning units and those we wrote ourselves so between several colleagues and even the external specialist that was already working with us when we did it for DEA we wrote our own learning material so we kept the lightning theme throughout and we took this lightning theme to to the other platforms to teams as well so this is the the my module site for this the short course then and we so we have all the learning units basic learning management system um just have the lightning to lightning theme to take it through and this is most of this or all of this is asynchronous so students can do this uh, whenever they are where they are in the beginning of the semester we give them this program we call it an activity plan so they know exactly what is waiting for them and so we give the dates the activities the weights the marks what it'll count them but we also tell them this is the time the practical will happen it's extremely important that they know and what the weight is because we wanted to keep the practical weight heavy because this is where most of the teaching actually happens and so if they don't attend the practical they're in trouble and we had to find creative ways then to deal with it either move the student to a next semester or uh, yeah creative ways so we we by design decided to make the practical very heavy all right so this is still on the learning management system so the first learning units the learning units we wrote um the learning units are only open after the impact question is now the impact question is we have is just 30 questions some of it silly little questions fun questions uh, which hopefully when they read it they laugh and think oh this is stupid and then some really serious questions, but we want to see with what kind of knowledge they come in with. So they do the impact question. The impact questionnaire then opens the six learning units for them. The six learning units then con consist of instructions. You will probably not be able to read that, but I honestly have no idea how to make it bigger. And um, so trust me, it says instructions and then the reading material, which is then the learning unit we wrote and they do a quiz and the reason for the quiz is basically to show them do they understand what they read are they ready for the practical because they have to do this to prepare for the practical and then this is all asynchronous so then the next thing is is the practical will will happen on microsoft teams so before the practical can you see we pull in the lightning theme again so we create the team more than a month before the practical and we start to upload information on it but i only load the students two weeks before the practical and there's a very good reason for it because then you give students too too much time to be naughty <laughs> they're humans they they can get very naughty and and the the on this um Microsoft site, you will welcome them, give a little bit of information, and then they have an introduction where they have to do, introduce themselves. And the main reason for that is they think if they have access to a Teams meeting, they have access to Teams and they have access to this team, but they don't. And if they can't access the team, they can't access the, the groups. I call the group squads. And simply because my kids told me that's a that's a very nice gaming term, mom, use it, use it. So, and the students like it, so they go into squads and they work in squads. So then I I load some material in the squads for them already, and then a lot I do during the prep. So in the general channel, I load class materials, library, and then practical documents, and I have training sessions. So I give them the the program I give them a letter they can give the employer so the employer can give them the time off even if they go to the office 
so that they have the time off to actually attend the practical session synchronously. And then I tell them the house rules and I have five training sessions which I record. And you would think five training sessions would be enough and five recordings would be enough. Not necessarily. Some students just don't, don't look at it. So in, in every squad, I will load um, information for them before the practical, which is good. So they can see there's some exercises coming up for them, but they, they haven't done the training yet because we will do the training and the videos and stuff like that, which is not available, but that's fine. They can look at the, the, the questions coming up. It, it prepares them. And then we have a, an intensive uh, program. This is the program that, that Phil Sneiman is the advocate working with me and Lindani is my colleague working with me as well. Um, that we use. So we give a, a simplified version of this for the students so they can more or less see, but this is for us to remember when we want to do something. And I would advise that if you ever want to do something like this, a synchronous practical session online, don't have less than three people. It is really difficult. I try to do it alone. It is absolutely impossible. You're working with people, you will always have somebody that's naughty. So while you're trying to teach and help students, there's one that tells you, oh, oh, but I can't get in. I haven't, I didn't look at the recording. And now you can't jump from the one to the other. So it really causes a lot of problems. But then I don't create a meeting before the time. I tell the students, you go to the squad and you wait for me on the first day of the practical. So the first day of the practical is crazy. It's like organizing a wedding. You can organize it as best you can. That day of the wedding, it's completely crazy. So I call them in a meet now, and then 90% of your students jump in. And I will introduce Phil, the advocate, and he will start to ask the students to introduce themselves. And we love this, because you really then get to hear where the students are from, um, uh, why they are doing this, we, we take time to do this. It, it actually is really nice. But in that time, Lindani can help the one or two that has fallen behind. And then after the introductions, we do an uh, impact quiz too. So it's exactly the same quiz. We just shuffle the questions because now we can see what the learning unit's impact was. So we can see how much they learned from the first, first day they came in to just before the practical. And we tell them that they have to do it to get access to the practical, but it, it isn't like that. <laughs> we just tell them it's a lie <laughs> so to, to make them do it because the more they more we have doing the, the quiz, obviously, the better the stats. And then we follow the program um, meticulously. We really keep to time because they ask their employers for time off and they they often ask their employers for data. And if and and so colleagues, I know you can't see my face because this is now like Irene said, we work from our context. And our context is students can't afford the streaming, so don't open your camera. And when I tried to open my camera this morning, it wasn't working. So never, never even thought of checking it over the weekend, you know. All right. So we follow the program. So as I told, showed you on the program, therefore, we have inspections and we have investigations. For the first inspection, Phil will do a very, very short um, PowerPoint presentation. So I'll just open so you can see. I'm not going to show you the entire open uh, PowerPoint presentation, just to show you how short it is, because the students come prepared. Well, they're supposed to. So it really is just to show a little bit, this is all about perspective, very nice um, artwork on perspective. And then you will run through basic things. Why are we doing this? What is environmental law? What is NEMA, the CMAS, compliance? And this is fun. How many crocodiles can fit into a hatchback car? So we often have things like that. So this was a smuggling of little crocodiles. Isn't that horrible? Uh, 200 and something. So we run through this entire thing and then they have an assignment. So this assignment, then they go back to their, their squad 
and then they do that squad ac activity. And they, in this instance, they now have to draw an inspection plan and I put the students in a squad. So this is where I now put the students randomly in squads. We try to do four to five students in a squad. So before the, the practical, I always create enough squads so that I have two extra for that one student that comes in on the last day or something like that. So here they run to their squad and they go and do this. And I create the meetings for them because if you allow them to create the meetings, oh my goodness, you have no idea how difficult it becomes. They will create four meetings and all four of them will be in different meetings. So I jump from squad to squad, open the meetings, get them working. And it is amazing. They love it. Uh, students that have started doing this with us, they're still friends. Okay, so the second one is the PowerPoint presentations that we, we started. I'll, I'll show a very short one, some of the pictures that we collected. So this is again about the inspection, and here they have to write an inspect, inspection report again in their group. And so we just used, um, I'll show uh, just a few pictures of what we did. And this was face-to-face, -face, and we really enjoyed it. So you can see the guy here in the, in the wig. Is one of the, the lecturers and one of the students helping. And just a, a week and a pair of glasses, and they can see that you're a different person. And so, yeah, we showed them how there's the, the terrible lawyer. She was a difficult one. There's Phil um, laughing because it's always fun. So this we missed. And so we have a whole inspection that we do with pictures. And and. It is obviously something we can also create, recreate into a video. Is the exercise again that they go and do in their in their in, um, squat then. So the third exercise, all I did here is I'm not going to show the PowerPoint. I think you you get what we're doing. Is the compliance notice, but we give them templates. So in the in the squad, I will have templates for them that they can work on. So this one you they will do individually, even though they can in their squad discuss it and they can help each other, they each have to write their own individual um, compliance notice. So for the individual activities, we we the templates give a little more help, where for the group activities, the templates are very thin. They they kind of need to go back to the, the learning material to make sure or ask or ask us. So then we get to the investigations and this is the part that we decided we're going to make some videos. Okay, so the first one we do is to show the students how important observations are, observation points where you set up a sting. So we do a, a, this video is the Green Scorpions video. So one of the videos the Department of Environmental Affairs allowed us to do. So the first thing we did was a very, very short PowerPoint presentation. Again, that Phil will just run through them. What is the, the difference between an investigation and an inspection? What is the purpose of investigation? And then we will do the video. And these are the questions that they need to ask. So these questions are posted for them in their, in their squad. They can work on these. So I want to show you this video. The, this video is a very professional video. So it's the one the Department of Environmental Affairs created. They paid a lot of money for it. We're allowed to use it. And this, this is what we try to copy in our little amateur way. And I'll show you what we did. So, so I'm not going to show you much, about five minutes, just so that you can see what the students um, receive.
Guys, we just received some information that there's something going down. Okay? An informant has just phoned in, and there's a, there's a vehicle. They're actually renting a premises, one of the little chalets here. And it's quite lucky because there's not many people renting chalets at this time of the year, so it shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, and the, the informant says that every time this time of the year, uh, the guys come in here and they do a switch. It's a high-value product. It's either rhino horn or ivory or both. So this is going down. The vehicles come in after 11 o'clock in the day. Uh, I've got a description of the vehicle as well. It's a white Chevy Avio or something. White Chevy Avio, no registration number. So uh, we need to get a plan together, people. How are we going to deal with this? Uh, so let's sort this out. We're talking high-value resources. We've got a lot of expertise sitting in the room. Uh, so we need to just run through a quick uh, investigation plan. How are we going to plan We this? had multi-agency you know, uh, uh, teams at like the end of the day. We, we just threw it open sure to the group and the guys knew the layout of the land because we'd been working on the area for about three days. Said, right, we need to stop the vehicle if it goes here. Right, what happens if it goes there? Well, let's put a vehicle there, you know. Let's get an observation guy up here because when it turns the corner we can't see it anymore. And what happens if he stashes equipment or, or, or illegal products under the culvert? Great, let's put an observation guy there. Who's got cell phones? I've got a cell phone. Great. Have you got swapping numbers? Uh, who's got a fast vehicle? I've got a fast vehicle, says the one guy. And the other guy says, yeah, but your vehicle looks like a, a, an official vehicle, so it's going to scare the guy away. Okay, fine, I've got a small vehicle, says a lady from uh, Marina Coastal Management. We end up using Limpopo's vehicle. So there was great teamwork. Hello? What's up? It's that. I got it, I got it. Okay, Jigga, I'm gonna I'm gonna come in with nothing, no? Then I'm gonna go out, and then and then I'm going to go out, pick it up, and then come back to do the swap. But I'm not gonna when I come in the first time, I'm gonna stop at number 21, just to hoi them off a bit. Okay. Okay, right. Well, ons is op die oomblik net besig um, te soek vir a plek waar ons hierdie, hierdie oupie, hierdie observasiepost kan doen. Waar ons een goeie, een goeie idee gaan kry oor die hele area. Wait, chap, so we don't go too far ahead. Uh, my volle naam is Johan Samuel Frederik Lemmer. So weer u dan, die getuinis wat u gaan aflees sal die waarheid en niks anders as die waarheid wees nie, en dien so, steek op u rechterhand en sê so help my God. So help my God. Baie dankie, dankie mevrouw Delta. On the 22nd of June 2007, were you uh, doing duties? Yes I was, ma'am. Can you uh, proceed and explain to the court uh, what type of duties you were doing on this specific day? Um, we were manning an operational post um, at um, the tennis courts close to the water purification plant, plant of the Marcelsport Resort. Um, at a, around 11 o'clock that morning, I'm not sure exactly about the time, but it's around 11 or 5 past 11 or so, I received a call from a colleague of mine, Mr. Johan van der Nest, who was at that point in time um, manning a, uh, an operational post at the checkpoint that a vehicle had entered the, the resort. Uh, I noticed the vehicle was standing at the boom gate. I walked outside and I asked the driver if he has been to the reception area to yes, book himself in to Marcelsport Resort. Yes. He's my scape. On the top of the car is stage Chalet number 13, as well as the date 24th of June, and at the bottom it says R. Adams. Yeah? What's it, you know, is it here? What's it clear? Silver, you know, okay? It's line number 13, okay? I see him there, but I see him there. One male person alighted from the vehicle from the driver's side. This person was wearing a khaki colored pants and a dark colored uh, top. He had dark hair and he was wearing glasses. Okay, I'm stopping it there. Um, it's a lovely video and it shows the students a lot and now they have to, the, the video is about 25 minutes about the observations and they have to now go back and write a report in their squad on the observations. Okay, so then here is some of the videos we try to do. So again, we start with a little bit of false PowerPoint presentations. And you will see again, it's it's very short. So there's our first video 
Just to Surf, The Adventures of Buster. Um, and for those of you that work at UNISA, you will recognize him. He's one of our colleagues. He needs a, he, he should receive a, a award for his, <laughs> his abilities in, in playing, playing these games. All right, so this is all again what they need to do. They need to do their pocketbooks, their statements, and their case dockets. All right, so I'm going to show you, play you five minutes of the first video and a few minutes of the second video just to show you the background. We set up the entire scenario. So we're trying to mimic the DEA videos, but we couldn't do it exactly the same. It, it's very difficult to edit it like they have. So this is what we did. I'll show you about 10 minutes, five minutes of the one, five minutes of the next one. Sissy, it's Basta. Hey Basta, what up? Yeah man, hey man, I need you to hook me up with a buyer. What you have? Yeah, I have some rhino horn here with me. Oh, okay, let me make some calls. I'll catch up with yeah. you later. Yeah man, hurry, hurry Sissy, this needs to happen today, ne? Okay, okay Basta, yeah. give me 10. Yeah, no, sharp, 10 minutes. Sharp. <laughs> Hello, Sissy, and you got a number for me? Yeah, Basta, got it. Call Liam mm. now. 
Oh man, listen. Sissy said you'd be interested in some horns. A kilo? How heavy is it? Eh, uh, I know. Maybe around a kilo. I'll pay you more than 10 k. Oh, so it's fine. It's fine. Okay, okay. There's a park not far down the road from where you are to ours. And don't be late. Oh, All right, sir. Adam, have you got something for me? Yes, I think I do. Nice. I heard it was going to go down in about two hours. What is? I think it's going to be a Rona Horn sale. Good. Where? Uh, Molly Park, uh, just down from Montgrave uh, Liquor Store. How many? Um, I'm not too sure. I think it's uh, possibly just two. The kit? Uh, it seems to be a... Uh, the local guy here is uh, camo, um, uh, khaki clothes with uh, blue or grey rucksack and a hoodie. Got it. Two perps, blue grey rucksack, rhino horn, molly park in two hours. We're on it. Good work, Adam. You've earned your meat today if we catch the buggers. Chat up later. Yes, you must be Sissy's boy. Eh? What have you got for me? I depend, bra. What have you got? My man, I promised you what I've got. I've got what I've got. You show me what you've got. What have you got there? Don't show me fake stuff there. Eh? Let me see. I, uh, 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 no, man. Money set, bro. Nah, I'll give you money your money. Set, money top. That looks good. Money that top. looks good. That looks yeah. really good. There's your money. Okay, so I'm stopping it there. Let me go to the second one. This is the arrest. Just to give the students a good idea of what's coming next. What's your name? You call me Pasta. Pasta who? Pasta Cheddar. You're not from around here. Where are you from? Hey, Libya, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, South Africa. I'm from everywhere. We believe the two of you were in the process of an illegal act. I'm an environmental management inspector. I'm arresting you for the illegal possession of rhino horn. You have the right to consult with a legal practitioner of your choice. If you prefer, the state can provide you with a legal practitioner. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say may be used as evidence in a court of law. Stephen, search him. Stand up and do a fresh search. 
Have you got anything sharp and dangerous on you? Is this your phone? What's the number? Is this your phone? Okay, so I'm taking a photo of the Nokia cell phone with the suspect. Also a backpack on site. Search the backpack. It's empty. And we have rhino horn. Take a photo of rhino horn and the suspect. And the bag is empty. The rest of the bag is empty. Okay. Also have a large sum of money found at the scene with the suspect and there is a second Nokia cell phone found at the scene that we believe belongs to the suspect. These items will be gathered for further forensic evidence and investigation. Okay, Captain, for records, uh, taking the Nokia cell phone into evidence that is code number PA6003 936654 okay I'm stopping it there because the rest of the video is just more on how to deal with the, the evidence and then a buster is taken to the police cells all right, so the next section of this is how to prepare the docket. And this is very important. If anybody ever works, if any of these students ever work on a case like this, they need to make sure they work with the police and they, and they do a proper docket. So the first part of the training again will be the PDF that uh, Phil created. And he will run through the, we will show this video now, he will run through the docket and show the students how to actually compile a complete docket so that they can do it in their squad. All right. So just to serve episode three is now in the police station.
Okay, and so poor Buster is behind bars. This is quite a long video, it's 14 minutes. So the rest of it is all in the police station where we show how they they lock the evidence, how they take fingerprints, how they take the pictures, how they collect the cell phone evidence, how they do the DNA testing of the horn. By the way, that's a fake horn, it's not real, don't worry. <laughs> it's a fake. You've got somebody in real trouble, though. And then how Sissy and Liam is also arrested. So the rest of the video is just to build all that for the docket. Okay, and then we go over to the court case. So, again, Phil will just do a little bit of a PowerPoint uh, presentation to prepare the students for the court case, because if you do the docket poorly, your case in court will be thrown out. And one of the most important things is the diary. So we help them to prepare to write a diary. They each have to write a diary. I, I, actually, they do it in the squad. Okay, so the I'm going to show a very short segment of the court case. When we did the court case, COVID had already kicked in and we couldn't, you could see we could still go to the police station. We couldn't. So we had to do a COVID court case, but it actually played in to our advantage. So these are all also colleagues of ours. Please call the magistrate. Yes, Mrs. Fainter. Your Worship, we are ready to proceed with trials in the matter of the state versus Mr. Buster Jeddah, Mr. Liam Mohima. Mr. Edi, are you ready to proceed? Uh, I am, Your Worship. I have started the recording, Mrs. Fenter. Please continue. Thank you, Your Worship. This is case number JRC 007 of 2021, the state versus Mr. Buster Jeda, Mr. Liam Moima, and Mrs. Sissy van Niekerk. Today is 11 September 2021. This is a case before the Regional Magistrates Court in Johannesburg. Mrs. E. Krieger, Kruger presiding, Mrs. M. Fenter, the prosecutor, and for the defense, Mr. G. R. Edie. You can proceed. Yes, can the accused come in? Thank you, Your Worship. You can proceed. Thank you, Your Worship. Sir, you are accused of the offence of carrying out a restricted activity involving threatened or protected species without a permit, being a contravention of Section 57.1 of the National Environmental Management Biodiversity Act 10 of 2004, read with Section 101. 1A, as well as sections 1 and 56 1, chapter 7, and section 102 of the said Act, and also read with Government Notice 151 in Government Gazette 29657 
of 23 February 2007 as amended and further read with Section 250 of the Criminal Procedure Act 51 of 1977. In that, on or about 5 June 2021 and at or near Molly Park, Jane Street, Johannesburg, in the regional division of Gauteng, you unlawfully and intentionally carried out a restricted activity involving a specimen of a threatened or protected species by having in your position and or conveying and or selling and or trading in and or buying and or giving and or accepting of one rhino horn of the species. White rhino being a listed, threatened or protected species without a permit issued in terms of Chapter 7 of the Act. How do you plead? Uh, not guilty. Uh, thank you, Worship. I confirm my appearance on behalf of all three of the accused. Uh, they please in accordance with my instructions. And, and all my clients at this stage wish to remain silent, Your Worship. Accused one, is that correct? Uh, indeed, that is correct. Mrs. Fainter, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Worship. The state calls Captain Mel Templar. Please state your full names for the record. My name is Captain Mal Templer. Do you have any religious objection to taking the oath? No, I do not. Please swear then, then that the evidence you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. If that is so, please raise your right hand and say, so help me God. So help me God. Do you have any religious objection to taking the oath? Yes, I do. Will you then solemnly affirm that the evidence you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. If that is so, say I solemnly affirm. I solemnly affirm. Mrs. Fenter. Okay, I'm stopping the video there and I'm not going to play the second video because it's all about the court case. So uh, Captain Templar will, will give evidence and then some other uh, witnesses will come in. We deliberately make some mistakes. So especially in the one about the court case, we deliberately make a few mistakes because we want the students to pick it up. For instance, Mal Templar will give the name of an informant and a, a police officer or Green Scorpion will never uh, reveal the informant. So we deliberately make a few mistakes. The, the rhino horn, the bag was never sealed. That is a mistake. So we do those mistakes for the students to pick up and then they do the investigation. That is the three days of the practical and they absolutely, absolutely love it. They really enjoy it. After the third day, they all say, no, we're not ready to have this finished. We want to go on. They really enjoy this. But then it's back to the, the, the session, the practical session on teens. And you can see what I can see then. As they worked through the exercises, the exercises they do as groups, and then some they do as individual students. These are all now on teams. I can then download those. We can assess them, mark them, and I can put the marks onto the Mayonisa system because no, I'm not allowed to mark on anything other than the learning management system, a UNISA rule. Okay. And then we have impact questionnaire three. So the, the last impact questionnaire that the students do is, again, exactly the same as the first two. We shuffle the, the question same. But we want to see the, what the, in, the impact of the, the practical is. And, and needless to say, 
Um, some of them come in with really good knowledge. So the first impact questionnaire shows that some with very little and those with little after the reading material, you can see that there's a, a, um, a better understanding. But after the practical, even those that came in with, with a quite a, a, a good knowledge, you could show, you could see that the impact questionnaire shows that the, the practical really has the biggest influence on the learning. And it is the most fun. Um, and so we do the third impact question and, and I do lock the blog then. The blog is the reflection. And it's interesting, you would think, oh, they're going to say, no, 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 they're not going to do it. But after the practical, they actually love to do it. They write very good reflections. Uh, which which also helps us. So the questions I I often get is um, what did you learn? How did how did how did this change you? And one of the things that I learned is going fully online is scary and complicated, and you make mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes, and uh, when you make mistakes, you just you just be honest. And you tell the students I made a mistake and a mistake and fix it. And sometimes it, it's amazing because CODs and, and line managers can be very harsh. Students aren't. They will just laugh and, and kind of help you to fix it. And then another thing is training. Go for training sessions. Do YouTube training. Go EduCourse training. Attend sessions like this. It's amazing. All of us learn today. It really helps you to do things. And then... The one thing that I can tell you is don't try to do something like this alone. It's so daunting and you you can't do everything. So we used Camtasia for the video. So we, we did most of the recording on cell phones and a little handheld uh, video recorder with a microphone that we could link to Buster's um, shirt. But most, and then the telephone calls, we'll just record um, while we're doing the, the not there, the afterwards and we used Camtasia to put in the music and to edit it and and some of my colleagues are really good with Camtasia it's something that you can learn to do like Irene showed us today you can really learn to do these things um the one thing that came out is that employers um prefer the online practical and and the reason was I, I received several calls from employers to say that we prefer this because they the students are naughty. They go from Limpopo to Pretoria or Joburg, and then they don't attend the practical and they fail. And now the employer can see they're sitting in their office and they're actually working, they're doing the practical. So the marks are better. If they attend the practical, they they almost can't fail. But if they don't attend the practical, they will fail. And then you need to really be prepared to reprimand naughty students. And I mean, we can all do it very diplomatically. You don't need to be nasty, but some students are naughty and you need to be prepared to reprimand them. But you also need to be prepared to help that one sitting in Timbuktu really don't have proper access and don't know where to go and where to find help and help that student. It's actually really satisfying to help somebody that really struggles. Um, I like that much more than reprimanding somebody. And then, like this course shows, and that's why we all want to implement gaming, is you when you have more fun, students cheat less and they attend better. They, they really take part in the group and the squad work and they take part in everything. Um, and And even even if if the more you you add on on having fun and and more gaming things, the better the students engage, the better the students engage, the better the marks are. Okay, and then what would I like to do in the future? Something that came up is they said, oh, if I knew this is the the what my certificate looks like. I would have worked harder. So I thought I'm going to show the students the certificate they're going to get because it's a carrot to make them work harder. So that is something that I never even thought of, but one of the students told me to do it. And then obviously really think I'm going to do more gamification on Moodle. I can do the, the levels and the badges and, and, and I'm sure I'll, I'll be able to, to incorporate more 
gamification. And colleagues, that is my story. And I would really appreciate advice. And you're welcome to ask any questions. I'm done now. So over to you, Willem. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped. OK, can you hear me? Yes. Right. I see my video has stopped. I don't know why. Maybe it will come back again. I Let stopped sharing me. now, so maybe I was still sharing. Sorry, Willem. No, it's no problem. OK. Elna. This has left us breathless, really. Um, you know, we looked at games and serious games, but these are serious games in practice. So realistic, serious games. And um, I wonder if there are many people who would love to uh, do these kind of serious games <laughs> because um, it can really get serious. But this was very good. Thanks a lot for that. And uh, we've got a few minutes. Are there anyone, is there anyone who wants to ask a question at this stage? Okay, Willem, I see there's a question there. Anna, the videos are awesome. Thank you. How did you edit all of this? Did you do it yourself? Did you use outside assistance? Not normal academies. <laughs> Actually, we're very normal <laughs> academics. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, yeah. So what we did is we, we really, and, and that's why I'm saying we all amateurs. I mean, Motla Levy gave an absolutely sterling <laughs> rendition of Buster Jeddah. Um, and Mel was fantastic. So, so all of the people that were doing the acting, which is normal academics, the, the videos we took was... We took videos with cell phones. We took videos with a, a little camera that we have, um, that we, that I had. I had a little camera, hand, handheld camera that we used for the green scorpions before with a microphone. And then we used Camtasia. And that's why I say, don't work in, mm -hmm. in isolation. Ask people for help. We, we did ask outside people. One of our colleagues' husband mm -hmm. can do work like this. And so we asked Karen, listen, can we come sit with your hubby? Can he show us what to do? And we did. We actually went and we sat with him and he showed us a few things. And so it took time. Look, the one thing that I can advise you, if you can get a bit of money and you, you have money and you can pay somebody, do it. Do the recordings. Because if somebody uh -huh. can just do the editing for you and you can pay somebody for the editing... Like, you know, and, and I mean, we're not talking here yeah, millions, you know, like um, 8,000, 10,000, you could probably make it much better. Um, there are some, some mistakes in the videos that we decided to edit. It is just too daunting. We're leaving it. Just leave it there. Some mistakes we did by design. We designed to have the mistakes in there because we wanted the students to see the mistakes and we wanted them to 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 actually learn from those mistakes um but there's there's more ways to do this and i honestly tell you we were all just normal academics that did this work we worked together we were a team working on this we helped each other we called in the help we had no budget for this at all so we spent our own fuel our own time used our own equipment does that wow. answer your question? Yes, thanks. <laughs> okay. The time is, has passed. Elna, once again, thanks a lot. We do appreciate it and we can give you a hand. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much, colleagues. Any advice? I would love to hear from you guys, please. Okay. Thank you. Our next speaker and the last speaker for the day is Ravi Bamji. Please tell me that I pronounce your name correctly. It's correct. Thank you very much. <laughs> then I'm very glad. Um, the development of AR tools for inquiry-based learning of metabolism 
in the university biochemistry module. Right, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present my work. So I'm a DPhil student at the University of Johannesburg, um, and I have a master's in biochemistry, and I'm a DPhil student for an integrated this um, integrated a DPhil. So my um, degree lies between the Faculty of Science and the Faculty of Education. My supervisor is um, Umesh Ramnarain from the Department of Science and Technology Education. And my co-supervisor is Dr. Gerard Kursen from the Department of Biochemistry. Um, so a brief overview. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if you can see my slides on the left as well. Unfortunately, I couldn't get it onto an F5 because of the screen sharing. Okay, so a brief overview of we my presentation. You. I'm just going to give you a background of um, biochemistry and what the um, what the coursework of biochemistry involves and why I have decided to incorporate augmented reality into my teaching and learning um, for biochemistry um, undergraduate students, as well as the research design. And I'm going to focus a majority of this discussion on how I developed the AR for my students. Okay, so biochemistry um, is a study of chemical processes within and relating to living organisms. And it is a subdiscipline of both chemistry and, bi and biology. And as such, it's an, it's an interdisciplinary field, which makes up, um, which is made up of structural biology, enzymology, and metabolism. So at the University of Johannesburg, the course of biochemistry is a mixture of theory and compulsory practical wet lab interactions. And students that are registered for a BSc degree in life and environmental sciences <clears throat> choose, bio sorry, choose biochemistry as a major. Um, however, the coursework of biochemistry is content heavy. And historically, students have expressed many learning challenges when it comes to um, adapting to study. So because biochemistry is an abstract science, they, there's a challenge to conceptualize um, the coursework. So it is the biochemistry is attributed to the complexity of molecular structures and pathways that occur at molecular level. So um, students cannot visualize the, the mitochondria and the cell. So because it happens um, at micro level, many students can't visualize what is happening through these pathways. So instead of understanding the work, many of them just um, tend to rote memorize in place of understanding it. And the difficulty of teaching these pathways have led many lecturers to explore different teaching me methods. So I have been teaching the practical sessions over the last 12 to 15 years, since 2010. Um, and my personal observations have shown that the connection between the, the, the theoretical and the practical aspects of biochemistry is not adequately made with the students. So the theory lectures and the practical laboratory training is not achieved, and therefore we need a multidimensional teaching and learning approach in order to improve students' conceptual development and understanding. And the recent explosion of extended reality, virtual reality, and augmented reality onto teaching platforms has enabled us to, um, to venture out and to try and integrate some of these, um, some of these teaching tools into incorporating into teaching students differently. So um, I'm sure all of you know what VR and AR. Um, so virtual reality would be a bit more um, cost expensive because we would, we would need the headsets. So ideally a class of biochemistry second year students are made up of between 80 and 100 students. So logistically it places me at a um, impasse because I would not be able to take all of the students into a virtual lab. That is why I chose the augmented reality um, pathway to go through to develop because augmented reality would be able to integrate the virtual environment for the students and it's allowing them an interactive experience where I could recreate real life objects. So it allows the viewer a composite view of the topic. So the aim of my research is to, is to introduce and investigate the affordances 
of an AR-based technology-enhanced method of teaching a practical aspect of metabolism in a university biochemistry module. So I chose three topics within metabolism that we do explore within the practical sessions. And I'm developing the AR, I've developed the AR for these three topics in specific, okay? So I chose them and I developed the AR platforms using Jigspace. And the objectives of my study is firstly to develop it, the AR and then to determine the impact of the AR tool on students' understanding of concepts in metabolism, to investigate whether the use of an AR tool increased students' motivation for learning metabolism, because many students, um, through speaking to past students or because they failed and they've come back, they have a very low motivation to study the, the module of metabolism. Students really hate metabolism. It is one of the hardest causes that they actually have to study. And also to summarize the experience of the lecturers, the teaching assistants, and the students after using the AR tool. Okay, so a little bit of um, theoretical uh, background. My research design is based in a, uh, a constructive paradigm, which emphasizes the learner's active participation in the learning process. So, um, for the constructive paradigm, the ideology is that learners construct knowledge by building upon their prior experiences and understanding rather than just absorbing information passively. So the sampling that I did last year with my pilot study was a convenient purpose of sampling because these are the students that are available to me and that I have access to. And um, the, it was a bit of a smaller number last year due to a large number of them failing biochemistry 2A. So only 43 students continued into biochemistry 2B. And I do have ethical clearance for the study and I followed the mixed method research design. So it's mixed exploratory where I did um, quantitative and qualitative research in a, in a single study in order to understand the research problem. So when it came to the AR conceptualization, my AR intervention was, I, I decided to introduce it using two jigs per topic. So the first jig that I've built is for students to visualize the experimental procedure as a pre-laboratory experience. So students view the jig in the AR after receiving a pre-lab lecture. So as Dr. Irene said this morning, I, I'm using AR as a supplementary tool. So it's not at the moment, it is not replacing any of the course material that they up to now have received. So by visualizing it, I want them to be able to visualize the steps of the experiment that they will be doing in class before they actually start the experiment. Because a lot of them come to class, they prepare by reading the practical guide, which is just written words step by step, but a lot of them don't understand what equipment we're going to be using or what the actual procedure is going to be. So by doing by giving them a visual a visual of the experimental procedure, I I'm trying to get them more prepared to working in the laboratory. And then the second jig or the second part of the AR inter intervention, I want to allow students to experience the molecular reaction. So. Students in high school, in first year and second year, mostly in, uh, in any life science or um, science degree, they experience um, molecules in a flat 2D. So when you look at your textbook, you see the flat Fisher projection. Students don't always look at molecules in a 3D. So they don't understand where molecules come together what amino acids are made up of, where that they have an amino group or they have a carboxyl group. I'm sorry, some of the terms might be getting lost in some of you. So um, to align it with the curriculum, I identified the learning concepts. So I'm going to be using the topic of transamination throughout my uh, presentation. That is one of the topics that I've developed. So transamination um, is a process that occurs in a molecular pathway in your body, and it's where amino acids are converted into keto acids. So I want students to be able to understand that amino acids contain carboxyl groups and amino groups, and these groups are not present in keto acids because keto acids have a different purpose in the cell. And then the learning outcomes, um, 
these are just two of the learning outcomes that I've put onto the slide. I do have five learning outcomes for this particular topic. So once students are viewing the AR, I want them to be able to differentiate between an amino acid and a keto acid. And I want them to be able to identify the amino group on the amino acid and the carboxyl group that is present on the amino acid. So I identified the learning outcomes before I started developing the AR tool. Okay. Um, once my tool was um, developed, I then, the implement, implementation of my AR was um, in class last year for the pilot study. So I had QR codes, which you, which um, Jigspace, uh, Jigspace automatically generates. The QR codes were printed and placed on the table for each group. So ideally, uh, so typically in our practicals, um, we break the students up into groups. And each group is was is uh, um, about four to five students. So students worked with iPads. So initially, uh, so Jigspace can work is um, um, accessible through um, Android as well as um, iPhones. Um, but a lot of the students were battling in the first lesson. They battled with accessing the and on the Android devices because sometimes if it's an old device, the Jigspace isn't applicable. Isn't um, it doesn't give you um, accessibility on the older tab on the oldest devices. So um, from our hub, uh, Prof Umesh has, has the Kelt team hub. From the hub, I borrowed iPads, and these were they were able to. Um, view the AR ideally, and all of them were able to interact with the AR. So the, the framework that I'm following is a guided activity. And I took the students through the steps of the AR tool as they viewed it. Okay, So this is um, just a screenshot of what my AR development looked like. And the first part is the visualization of the experimental procedure. So this is my lab bench. I will show you the entire procedure towards the end of this presentation. And the second part is where I converted the molecules from the 2D to 3D. Um, Jigspace is a licensed software, and UJ has, a license, uh, has purchased the license. So I work on Jigspace. Um, when it came to the development of the AR, the experimental process, like I've said, was developed on Jigspace, um, but it was a multi-step process. So it's not merely just taking the molecules. I had to first retrieve the 3D molecules from PubChem, and then I converted the files to a number of different software programs. So um, I'm going to show you my, the next few slides. The next few slides takes you through screenshots of how exactly I converted them. And it starts off by going to PubChem. So PubChem is a um, open-based uh, platform where you can go and you can put in the name and search the name of the molecule that you need. I'm sorry if the, it's not very clear. So one of the first amino acid in transamination is glutamate. So I search for glutamate. Once you get the molecule that you are looking for, so my molecule is called monosodium glutamate, and you confirm whether the molecular weight is the ideal one that you're looking for. You it will you then click on that structure, and it will take you. It will open up the next page, which will show you a 2D structure of glutamate as well as a 3D structure. If you click on the 3D structure, it will then allow you to choose the ball and stick, just a stick, or um, a few other ones, a space for molecule, whichever one, whichever molecule you want to work with. Um, I, I choose the ball and stick because it gives me the proper configuration of the amino groups and the carboxyl groups. You are then, uh, pro you can then download the SDF file. Okay. Once you have the SDF file, you can, I, um, I, I create file folders on my desktop. And I save all of the folders onto into the SDF file. Then the next software program that I use is Chimera. So Chimera is also a modeling system software program. And Chimera converts your SDF files into DAE files. So Jigspace has um, a limited number of types of um, files that you can upload onto Jigspace. So that is why I have to convert them through this entire process to get them 
onto an FBX file in order to upload them into Digspace. So in Chimera, um, if you download in Chimera, this is the version of Chimera that I have. It's version 1.17.3. And in Chimera, once you have the Chimera software on your computer, you can then open up your SDF file and it will show up in 3D in Chimera. You can then go and export the scene then into a collada, which is a DAE file. So it's a multi-step process again. Then you go into Blender and you import the collada files from your Chimera now into Blender. So you first import the collada files into Blender. Once you have the, the once you have your molecule in Blender as a collada file, you can then export the collada into an FBX file. And once you have the XPF file in Blender, you can save it and then you go onto Jigspace, onto Jig, and you can import that as a FBX file or a CAD file. So when you open a Jig page, um, you can then um, select import, install, import file, import CAD file, and you can then select your file that you want to import. So it's unfortunately, that was the easiest way of doing it. Um, my co-supervisor, Dr. Corson, um, has actually developed a protocol on how to convert these files. Another way that he does it is by using Euphoria and Unity, but due to time constraints and because I was using Jig already for the, for the one part of my um, AR, I didn't want to have two different software programs that I need to open up in class. So that is why I imported the files both into Jigspace. It, ju it just gave me um, easier access to the, um, to the files while I was in class because of time limitations during practicals. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how I've, how I've developed them and to take you through the experimental procedure in Jigspace. So I'm just going to stop sharing the screen and I'm going to share my Jigspace screen. Okay. I'm oh, sorry, I went to the wrong one. Sorry, I'm just closing this because I went to the wrong jig. That's the second one that we need to look at. And now jig space is hanging. So unfortunately, because my molecules are quite bulky, I sometimes do I do get a message and it just it does take a bit of a while to open up the molecules in jig space, which is what's happening at the moment. Um sorry, Rovel, sorry to interrupt you. Um your time is almost finished. If you can close okay. off, we'd be very glad, please. Okay. Um, so let me just show you. Um, I'll just show you one of them. Sorry, Jig is not responding. Um, okay. So I'm going to show you the experiment quickly. Okay, so this is the, the visualization of the experiment. So I've developed, I haven't developed it alone. I had a honest student that is really good with Jig and he helped me to build this in. So he used Blender for most of the objects and the others we got from the library. Um, sorry, it's taking a bit of a while to load. But basically I developed the AR and it takes the students through a step-by-step -step process of exactly what is going to happen in the experiment. So they, it's the lab bench with the test tubes and the water bath. And if they read this, the captions underneath, they'll be able to prepare for the for practicals and to be able to come into the lab knowing exactly how many test tubes they need, what equipment they're going to be using, what temperature the water bath needs to be at. Um, 
and they're ready to go and they're ready to do the experiment. So our practical sessions normally run for eight hours per week. And that is why if students come prepared, it allows them, it gives them an advantage to be ready for the experiment, as well as it gives them an idea of what exactly needs to be done in the experiment. Um, I'm sorry, Jig seems to be hanging and it doesn't want to load. So um, I think I'm gonna have to end there. It's saying loading, but it, nothing's happening at the moment. I would have really loved to show it to you, but unfortunately, yeah. it's not. Technology is not playing its part. Yes, Robert, thanks a lot for a well prepared presentation. We really Thank appreciate you. that. That was really good. Um, are there any last questions that one of you guys want to ask, Robia? Um, uh, Dr. Willem, perhaps not. Not a question, just a comment. Uh, but if Rabia yeah. can prepare something for us, like a, a small video, we can share it with the participants and then everyone can see what, what she's been doing. Sure. I, I'll try it. I'll uh, I'll even share the link, uh, Dr. Myberg, and then you'll be able to just, if you go in through Chrome, you'll be able to go through and have a look through the uh, jig. That, that, that would be excellent. Thanks, Rabia. Okay. Thanks for that one, Dr. Amon. And Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of the day, um, to the end of the morning for Dr. Irene, or the start of the morning. <laughs> Thanks a lot for every one of you who presented. Every presentation was unique and very good, and we really appreciate that. Thank you for the workshops this afternoon. Wow, the two workshops were excellent. We really do appreciate that. And be good, and we're going to see each other in September again, if God wills. Be good, we'll see you again. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.